My name is Stephen Levin. I'm chair of the Council's Committee on General Welfare. I want to welcome you all today for this hearing on homeless shelter conditions, as well as the hearing of a number of pieces of legislation. we can get to those in a minute. <clears throat> New York City continues to face record levels of homelessness. The Department of Homeless Services, otherwise known as DHS, data shows that as of one week ago, over 61,000 individuals were in the DHS shelter system. This includes over 39,000 people in, with families with children, individuals and families with children. The average length of stay for those in shelter continues to increase, particularly for single adults. In March of 2015, the Department of Investigations released a report that revealed extremely poor conditions in city, shelter, city shelters. Residents were found to be exposed to serious health and safety violations, including vermin infestation, non-working smoke and carbon monoxide detectors, and improper or missing certificates, certificates of occupancy. DOI's investigation also found a lack of social service programs in many of these locations. Among the worst were cluster sites. They were the most poorly maintained and poorly monitored with the least amount of social services available to families. Hotels were also found with reoccurring complaints of rat and mice infestations and many buildings, many building and fire violations. This report, frankly, was not a surprise uh, to any shelter provider and any individual who resides in shelter. The city controller conducted an audit then of 101 apartments at eight random DHS family shelters the same year as the DOI report and found that, quote, DHS does not have sufficient controls to ensure that units within the shelter facilities are adequately maintained, that the needs of homeless families are assessed in a timely manner, or that families receive appropriate services, including those designed to assist them in transition to permanent housing. The majority of apartments inspected by the controller had one or more health or safety concerns, including vermin infestation, peeling paint, water damage, and mold on bathroom ceilings. We have also heard that there are HVAC issues, plumbing issues, broken elevators, and basic cleanliness concerns. In December of 2015, the administration took an in-depth look at homeless services by conducting a 90-day review. From that review, the city identified a series of reforms, including those directly pertaining to homeless shelter conditions. The administration has testified several times before this committee and has made announcements to the public on the progress of some of these reforms, including shelter security, shelter inspections, the phasing out of cluster sites and hotels, and the plan to create 15,000 new units of supportive housing. It has also updated the public on its plan to open 90 new shelters and expand the city's existing shelters over the next several years to allow for the closing of all commercial hotels by the end of 2023. The 2015 DOI report free previously mentioned calls for the creation of an interagency task force. In May 2015, two months after the release of the DOI report, a shelter repair squad comprised of DHS, FDNY, DOB, HPD, and DOHMH was launched to expedite the correction of violations at over 500 city shelters. In January of 2016, the shelter, repair, shelter Repair Squad 2.0 was launched to systematically identify and address shelter conditions that it were, had been left unaddressed for decades. Teams from HPD, HRA, and DHS focused on clearing conditions in non-cluster shelters. As a result, the city has reduced violations by 84 percent since January of 2016, conducting more than 34,000 inspections in 2016 and 17. While we recognize that many of these issues didn't happen overnight, and have built up over years and even decades, we need to address the problems head on and ensure that ci the city's obligations to shelter doesn't just include the bare bones of a roof and walls. We have an obligation to create healthy, clean environments with timely repairs and appropriate services to get adults and families on the way to permanent housing. I commend the administration for the work that has been done so far, but this is a huge undertaking that we'd like to have, and we'd like to have ongoing updates on. Today, the committee looks forward to learning what improvements have been made at shelters in recent years and what hurdles still remain. Additionally, the committee would like to hear progress since the 2015 DUI investigation, including the physical improvements, wraparound services, and health and mental health services that each shelter should be providing. We'd also like to hear from those of you that are here today to comment on the improvements that have been made and offer any suggestions that you may have for how these reforms can be changed, improved, or expanded upon. In addition, the, will, the committee will be hearing six bills, intro 884 by Councilmember Rafael Espinal in relation to requiring the Department of Homeless Services to report on short-term 
notice, sorry, short notice resident transfers in shelter. Intro 883 by Councilmember Espinal in relation to requiring the Department of Homeless Services to provide customer service training. Intro 915 by Councilmember Rafael Salamanca in relation to requiring the Department of Homeless Services and Human Resources Administration to post shelter, supportive housing, and cluster site data. Intro uh, 1110 by Councilmember Salamanca in relation to housing specialists within the Human Resources Administration and Department of Homeless Services, and two bills that I've sponsored, intros 1232 and 1233 in relation to requiring homeless shelters to post signs and distribute other material relating to shelter transfer appeal process, and in relation to providing written notification for non-emergency shelter transfers. Lastly, I just want to take one moment here to acknowledge what happened to Jasmine Headley at the Borum Hill HRA office, which is in the district I represent, the other week. Um, uh, and as chair of this committee, I, I feel the need to speak on it today. Um, what happened to Jasmine Headley is appalling and unacceptable. I'm outraged by the actions of HRA and NYPD officers that led to the arrest of Ms. Headley for simply trying to access benefits to which she is entitled. There is no excuse for this type of force. This incident has revealed deeper issues in our city's social services system that we need to be looking at. In the weeks and months to come, we will be putting a lot of thought into how we can respond legislatively and address issues across the system. But there are still some immediate major concerns and major questions that we need answers to, such as why was Jasmine, Jasmine Headley's child care benefit cut off in the first place? Why were there no reasonable accommodations for mothers and children at an HRA center who have to wait for hours on end? Why was her wait time so long? What is the existing protocol for HRA calls to 911, and what data is publicly available for how often 911 is called for each precinct that an HRA center is in? We owe it to Jasmine, to her child, and to all families who rely on the city's social services to answer these questions honestly, forthrightly, take a deep look in the mirror, and critically examine why our city allowed this to happen in the first place under our watch. We are collectively responsible here. So I'd like to thank Commissioner Banks and his team for testifying today and his dedication to the New York City shelter system. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who are here today. Um, Councilmember Diana Ayala of Manhattan and the Bronx, Councilmember uh, Barry Gradenchik of Queens, Councilmember Adrian Adams of Queens, Councilmember Rafael Salamanca of the Bronx, Councilmember Mark Jonai of the Bronx, Councilmember Antonio Reynoso of Brooklyn, and Councilmember Vanessa Gibson of the Bronx. And lastly, I'd like to thank my staff of the General Welfare Committee, Amanda Kilowan, Senior Counsel, Tanya Cyrus, and Crystal Pond, Senior Policy Analyst, and Julia Haramis finance analyst for putting this hearing together. I'd also like to thank my chief of staff, Jonathan Boucher, and legislative director, Elizabeth Adams, um, as well for all the work that they put into this hearing. And I would like to turn it over to Councilmember Salamanca if he has some opening remarks on his legislation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Levin, for holding today's hearing. Uh, let me start off by uh, saying thank you to some of the organizations that I see here today, a Coalition from the Homeless, the Supporter of Housing Network, and others. Your work is incredibly important, and I appreciate the services and support you offer to the homeless and those who need help. Today, we'll be hearing testimony around my bill, Intro 195, which would require DHS, DHS to submit to every council member, community board, and post on his website quarterly reports on the number of shelters, supportive housing, including both single-site supportive housing and scattered site and cluster sites. The total number of shelters, supportive housing facilities, and cluster sites be separated out by council district and community boards. I have anywhere between 35 to homeless shelters in my district. Since my time as a district manager, I've never really known this number because there, has, there hasn't been any reliable information provided to me. I believe that communities and council members should know what's in their districts. Now let me be clear, I am not anti-shelter. I support supportive housing and I want to help some of the neediest New Yorkers. I am appalled at some of the ne nesbianism, not in my backyard, we've heard around stalling shelters in some of the city's more affluent communities. The issue of homelessness and affordable housing are two of the biggest issues we're facing here in the city and they must be dealt with citywide. 
I believe that each of the 51 council districts should be doing their part to house the homeless. That means setting up shelters and supportive housing units across the city, not just in concentrated in a few communities. Let me also tell you what this bill does not do. It does not require specific addresses to be reported. This way, domestic violence shelters can remain in undisclosed location for safety reasons. It is not my intention to create barriers to opening shelters. What I'd like to see is that the city take a thoughtful approach in how it sites shelters across all five boroughs. Ultimately, we both have the same goal of having enough housing and shelters for the homeless, and I am with you on that. We will also be introducing intros 1110, which would designate housing specialists within all temporary shelters and to submit an annual report on housing specialists. This bill will also update requirements for housing specialists in DHS transitional housing facilities and would require DHS to submit an annual report on housing specialists. Finding housing is incredibly difficult. Having the right paperwork, getting your finances in order, and navigating the housing process can be tricky and, may, and many may give up along the way. These housing specialists can help connect the dots for those struggling to find appropriate housing. I look forward to today's conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councilmember Salamanca. Um, uh, Commissioner Banks, uh, if you will, um, I'm meant to kill on Council of the Committee. will uh, ask you to be sworn in. Commissioner, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Levin and members of the General Welfare Committee. Thank you for inviting me to appear before you today uh, to discuss the Department of Homeless Services shelter system, specifically the progress made over the past few years to transform the shelter system as we work to help New Yorkers experiencing homelessness get back on their feet with dignity. My name is Stephen Banks and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Social Services. In this capacity, I oversee the Human Resources Administration and the Department of Homeless Services. Uh, to begin, I would like to address the extremely troubling incident at one of our Brooklyn client locations, which culminated in the arrest of an HRA client. What happened at the Human Resources Administration's DeKalb Center on Friday, December 7th, 2018, was completely unacceptable and should never happen again in New York City. On behalf of our agency and our dedicated frontline staff in all five boroughs, I apologize to Jasmine Headley and her one-year-old son and to the people of the city of New York for the actions that were taken that day. As reflected in the NYPD body-worn camera videos, there were multiple points at which this incident could have and should have been diffused. Last Monday, I placed two HRA peace officers on modified duty with no client contact. Consistent with their collective bargaining agreement, on Friday, I suspended these two officers without pay for the maximum period of time, and DSS will file disciplinary charges against them that could result in termination. Going forward, unless there is an immediate safety threat, I am directing that HRA peace officers shall not request the intervention of the NYPD without first contacting the center director or deputy director or her or his designee to attempt to defuse the situation by addressing a client need. Within the next 90 days, we will conduct retraining sessions for all HRA peace officers with an emphasis on techniques for de-escalating disputes in HRA centers. Thereafter, this enhanced training will be a mandatory annual requirement for each officer. I intend to attend each retraining session to speak to the HRA peace officers regarding the importance of de-escalating disputes. DSS has directed the city's contracted security services vendor to provide retraining sessions for all security guards assigned to HRA centers with an emphasis on techniques for de-escalating disputes in HRA centers. Thereafter, this training will be a mandatory annual requirement for any contracted security officer assigned to an HRA office. In addition to existing DSS customer service staff training, DSS has requested and received an OMB funding commitment to develop implicit bias training for all 17,000 DSS staff members to promote diversity in the workplace and dignity-centered client services. Building on the reforms through which 85% of SNAP food stamps applications and recertifications are now submitted online without the need for clients to come into an HRA center, HRA will continue to move forward with expanding online access to cash assistance clients subject to any necessary state approvals. 
Together with the NYPD Commissioner, we will take the following actions. The NYPD and DSS will develop a protocol for determining appropriate instances in which HRA peace officers and HRA centers should seek the assistance of the NYPD. The NYPD and DSS will develop a protocol to deploy an NYPD supervisor to be part of the NYPD response team for such HRA assistance requests. The NYPD and DSS will develop a protocol for transferring control of an incident to the NYPD when the NYPD arrives at an HRA center. I agree with what uh, Council Member, the Chair Levin said in his opening remarks, and I know we'll be talking further about these, uh, about the reforms to address this situation as we go forward. Turning to the shelter system, a system built up over time. I would like to begin my testimony today by briefly providing some historical context to the shelter system that built up haphazardly over the past four decades. From 1994 to 2014, the shelter population in New York City increased 115 percent. And between 2011 and 2014, following the abrupt end of the Advantage Rental Assistance Program, the DHS shelter census increased by 38 percent. During this same time, New York City faced increasing economic inequality as a result of stagnant wages, a lack of affordable housing, and increased cost of living. Rents increased more than 18 percent while wages increased by less than 5 percent, and 150,000 rent-regulated apartments were lost. The resulting dramatic increase in the shelter population coupled with underinvestment created real challenges as DHS and the agency's not-for-profit partners worked to adequately ensure safe, clean, and secure conditions. While we know there is much work to be done, the data shows that our strategies to address this crisis that has built up over 40 years are beginning to take hold. Prevention first. Evictions by city marshals are down 27 percent since 2013 through our investments in tenant legal services and rent arrears payments. Addressing street homelessness. More than 2,000 individuals have come in off the street and remain off the streets since we implemented Homestat in 2016. Expanding social services rehousing initiatives. Since 2014, more than 100,000 men, women, and children have moved out of shelter or averted homelessness altogether with our new rental assistance and other rehousing programs. Transforming the approach to providing shelter and services. Last year, the DHS shelter census was flat year over year for the first time in a decade. And this year is essentially flat again, despite providing shelter to more than 500 Puerto Rican evacuees whom the Trump administration abandoned. And we have reduced the DHS shelter per, uh, footprint from 648 shelter sites reported in Turning the Tide uh, in 2017 to 464 today. And we have cited 29 new borough-based shelters with 18 already up and operating. With respect to shelter conditions specifically, the administration has set out to address the cumulative impact of years of underinvestment in shelter maintenance, security, and client services. Following the 90-day review of homeless services in 2016, we developed and are currently implementing comprehensive reforms to transform the city's approach to providing services and shelter to New Yorkers experiencing homelessness. Uh, a multifaceted strategy, immediate and long-term efforts. In order to address both the immediate and long-term needs of shelter infrastructure and to maximize our efforts as well as we help homeless families and individuals get back on their feet, we employed a multifaceted approach through which we engaged in rapid response efforts to immediately address and improve conditions in shelters, while simultaneously working to raise the bar and strengthen the agency from top to bottom. Since the 90-day review in 2016, the administration has reduced building violations and is working to create a safe and dignified physical environment and shelter. We are making progress towards this goal by committing to get out of 360 cluster sites and commercial hotel locations with a priority to exit cluster sites with the worst physical infrastructure. Since January 2016, the city has closed more than 1,800 cluster sites, including transitioning roughly 300 units at a handful of cluster sites to operate as state licensed tier two not-for-profit shelters representing more than a 50 percent reduction in the cluster site program citywide. The city was managing 3,658 cluster units in January 1, 2016. As of October 31, 2018, the city is utilizing fewer than uh, 1,800 cluster units as shelter and continues closing cluster units at a rapid pace. Earlier this month, we announced that the city is concluding an agreement for the acquisition and conversion of nearly 500 cluster units across 17 buildings 
into permanent affordable housing for over 1,000 New Yorkers in need as part of the administration's broader initiative to address homelessness in New York City. Expanding the Shelter uh, Repair Squad, a multi-agency task force to, -inspect, to inspect shelters and repair building code violations. As a result of more comprehensive inspections, partnering with all four inspection agencies, the Department of Buildings, the Department of Housing and Preservation Development, the Fire Department, the Department uh, of uh, uh, Health and Mental Health, to undertake coordinated inspections of all shelter buildings, we've identified and remediated more violations than ever before. Over the last three years, the city and shelter providers have addressed more than 25,000 violations. Since 2015, unremediated violations within DHS shelters have been reduced by 86%. Building and instituting a system which allows the inspection agencies to efficiently track building code violations across all shelter buildings. This system provides an expansive view of the shelter system as a whole and allows DHS to communicate meaningful data about shelter conditions and amenities both internally and across city and state agencies. Developing and publishing the shelter repair uh, scorecard, a monthly public report on all unremediated violations and conditions present within DHS shelter buildings. Significantly increasing investments in capital repairs and significantly increasing investments in our not-for-profit partners so that providers are more readily able to address issues in their buildings. We've invested $600 million over 10 years to expand capacity and improve physical conditions at family and adult shelters. These efforts are part of DHS's overall strategy to raise the bar for shelter performance, strengthen the agency through effective policies, procedures, and data and to expand and improve shelter capacity. With this framework in place, we and our partners are committed to delivering the best services possible for New Yorkers experiencing homelessness so they can get back on their feet as quickly as possible. Getting out of clusters. Last year, we announced Turning the Tide, the mayor's plan to transform the city's approach to providing shelter. The plan puts people and communities first by ending the use of decades-old stopgap measures like cluster shelter sites and commercial hotel rooms, and instead opening a smaller number of new borough-based shelters to help families and individuals stay connected to the anchors of life, such as schools, jobs, health care, families, houses of worship, as they get back on their feet. The city's effort to get out of clusters is a key component to improving the lives of New Yorkers experiencing homelessness. As 2015 data showed that approximately 70% of building violations were found at cluster sites. Moreover, we prioritize closing the clusters with the worst violations to address the most pressing infrastructural issues. As noted above, we've exited more than 50% of cluster units, and we're on pace to end the use of cluster units as shelter by our end of 2021 deadline. As part of the implementation of Turning the Tide Plan, the administration is proceeding with an initiative to convert cluster shelter units to permanent housing, including through eminent domain if necessary, to help end the 18-year-old cluster program. As the first part of this effort, we announced earlier this month that the administration is moving forward to finance the acquisition of 17 cluster buildings by trusted locally-based not-for-profit developers who will rehabilitate the sites working with the city's Department of Housing and Preservation and Development and create affordable housing for homeless families. The cluster buildings included in this first phase of conversion to permanent housing will help nearly 500 families, including more than 1,000 people experiencing homelessness, secure permanent affordable housing. We expect to finalize this first phase in early 2019. When these sites transition to not-for-profit ownership, the new not-for-profit owners will enter into regulatory agreements with HPD to ensure the long-term affordability of the former cluster housing for homeless families and other low-income New Yorkers. At this point, homeless families residing at these locations eligible for rental assistance and prepared for housing permanency will be offered the opportunity to remain as tenants with new rent-stabilized leases should they wish to remain in the building. Additionally, all non-cluster tenants living in a cluster building at the time of purchase will be able to remain in their apartments with rent-stabilized leases and additional protections under HPD's regulatory agreement. This recent agreement is a testament to the potential for success in transitioning cluster sites into permanent affordable housing through a negotiated resolution, and we are working on additional conversions. If negotiations to finance the purchase of additional cluster buildings for permanent housing are not successful, the eminent domain tool remains on the table as an option to acquire additional locations. Clearing building code violations. Complementary to the plan of getting out of cluster sites are our efforts to ensure clients can safely access services in traditional shelters by identifying and mitigating building violations. The mayor established the Shelter Repair Squad as a multi-agency task force to inspect shelter buildings and repair building code violations. 
The task force is comprised of the Fire Department, the Department of Buildings, the Department of Housing Preservation Development, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and the Department of Homeless Services. Each agency has assigned teams to the Shelter Repair Squad for both inspection and repair. And through this task force, skilled trades and inspection personnel are deployed to address violations and accelerate critical repairs at homeless shelter citywide. At least two times per year, each agency will inspect facilities for code violations and inform providers of the results. Efforts are coordinated between the agencies to maximize the efficiency of the inspections, minimize the duplication of efforts across teams and agencies, and reduce the burden of frequent inspections. At DHS, we conduct routine site review inspections called RSRIs to identify both direct violations as well as conditions that may become problematic over time. RSRIs assist us in identifying and mitigating the most immediate safety hazards while also providing an opportunity to conduct preventive maintenance and minimize the number of units placed offline at any given time. During the RSRI, a DHS inspector is accompanied by the landlord, building manager, shelter director, head of maintenance, security, owner representative, caseworker, and or other managerial staff. If any conditions are deemed hazardous or dangerous, the inspector immediately notifies those who are part of the walkthrough. Upon receiving an email of the RSRI results, the provider has 24 hours to address severe deficiencies in the building's infrastructure. The RSR report provides a sufficient detail to help the providers develop and implement a remediation plan for the identified building conditions that require attention. The shelter director also submits a corrective action plan to DHS, which informs next steps to address the conditions identified in the RSRI at the shelter. Multiple re-inspections are conducted throughout the process of completing a CAP, or corrective action plan, which occur prior to the next scheduled RSRI inspection. In this way, when the inspectors perform the next RSRI, the action plan informs the walkthrough so that they can ensure all identified needs have been addressed. This inspection system allows city agencies to work with shelter providers to identify building issues, immediately address dangerous or hazardous conditions, prevent deeper infrastructure issues, and follow through to improve the conditions of each shelter. The Shelter Repair Squad is a prime example of interagency collaboration to address longstanding issues across the shelter system. In the first year of this program, more than 12,000 building violations were corrected. And applying lessons learned from the first year, the administration announced in 2016 the rollout of the Shelter Repair Squad 2.0. As we reported previously, the Shelter Repair Squad conducted more than 42,000 shelter inspections from 2015 to 2017, reducing violations that went unaddressed for many years by 86%. Today, many of the remaining repairs involve normal wear and tear and capital projects which, are funding, which we are funding and will be discussed later in this testimony. During the 90-day review in February 2016, the city also established a shelter hotline to enable shelter residents to formally communicate issues about shelter conditions. This not only provides an empowering avenue through which shelter clients can become involved in improving shelter conditions, but it also helps us keep an ear to the ground and identify potential conditions that require attention. Tracking progress through the shelter repair scorecard. Another critical component of the shelter repair squad is the ability for the city to track all shelter building violations, along with measuring the progress made towards ameliorating the identified issues. To drive this task, the city developed a system to report on all city shelters and every violation attributed to each building. Essentially, this acts as a real-time tracker for shelter building violations, allowing the city to appropriately allocate shelter repair squad staff to work with providers to inspect buildings and develop and implement remediation plans. As a testament to the utility of the system, the framework uh, has since been adopted by the state to develop their shelter management system, which allows our oversight agency to more efficiently monitor building conditions by tracking the status remediation and life cycle of deficiencies and their responses by providers and users. Information is aggregated from various sources available to DHS to provide a central clearinghouse where users retrieve information about shelters or evaluate and track the status of repairs at shelters or information that informs intake decisions, including requests for reasonable accommodation. This approach facilitates interagency collaboration in improving conditions in shelters and makes it possible to formulate the monthly shelter repair squad, which publicly reports on the conditions of homeless shelter facilities. The scorecard helps define the scope of any problems by publicly listing conditions at all homeless shelters in New York City that do not meet applicable regulations and makes it possible to track progress in dealing with them. The Shelter Repair Squad contains a summary page showing the total number of inspections conducted, any new problems found, and violations and other conditions resolved each month. A list of all shelter buildings with uh, summaries of the conditions in each building 
and a report card for each individual shelter with a number and each type of violation in progress and fixing them. This page will describe the type of shelter, the total number of units, and the owner of the building. Financing. On a parallel track to the efforts of the Shelter Repair Squad, we are doubling down in our short and long-term determination to adequately fund our not-for-profit sector and provide our partners with efficient mechanisms so that they are able to deliver the services our homeless clients rely on as they get back on their feet. As part of the Turn of the Tide plan to reduce our footprint while meeting capacity needs and improve physical conditions at family and adult shelters, $600 million in capital funding was allocated in FY18 over 10 years to help achieve this goal. This builds on over $42 million over four years in FY16 for 30 new capital projects at shelter facilities to address DHS shelter conditions and $90 million over five years in FY17 for building upgrades at facilities, including 61 new capital projects. Our commitment to adequately fund our not-for-profit sector is further exemplified in the FY19 executive budget in which we invested an unprecedented $236 million to increase funding for providers to both maintain and repair the physical infrastructure of shelters and provide social services in shelters. This increase in funding is complementary to the additional $163 million we spend annually for health and mental health services in shelter. Overall, the FY19 to FY22 September capital budget contains more than $350 million for capital pro uh, projects. DHS manages some of our projects in-house and other generally larger projects are managed by in partnership with the Department of Design and Construction. At this moment, we have 61 projects actively being designed and 24 projects that are in construction. DHS and DDC have 45 projects in the planning stage preparing for design, all of which are planned to begin during the fiscal year. Responding to introductions, proposed intro number 915. Intro 915 would amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to requiring the Department of Homeless Services and Human Resources Administration to post shelter, supportive housing, and cluster site data. DSS has already made a commitment to engage in efficient shelter reporting, including items such as rental assistance placements, information regarding the census of shelter facilities, supportive housing placements, security, and model budget contracts. We look forward to working with the sponsors to address the intent of this bill through our reform initiatives and practices, including any modifications that would be helpful based on discussion with the sponsors. Proposed intro uh, 1110. Intro 1110 would amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to housing specialists within the Human Resources Administration and Department of Homeless Services. We agree that having professionals available to help individuals experience homelessness, find permanent affordable housing, is one of many important components needed to help individuals and families get back on their feet. Accordingly, we would like to work with the sponsors to craft legislation that is both effective and operationally feasible to address an aim that we share. Proposed intro 883. Intro 883 would amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to requiring the Department of Homeless Services to provide customer services training. DHS agrees that training staff is an important effort. We're already working to implement a comprehensive array of trainings for shelter staff, and we look forward to working with the sponsors to align the bill with our reform initiatives that are in progress. Proposed intros 884, 1232, and 1233. These three proposed bills would amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to various components of shelter transfers. As part of the 90-day review, we identified reform of shelter transfer process as a priority. DHS has drafted a transfer policy to reform the longstanding process. While we comply with current state transfer regulations that have governed transfer policy, the State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance, OTDA, our oversight agency, has advised us that is issuing additional regulations that would preempt any local procedures that we had, pl that we had planned to implement. A state OTDA advised that this, these regulations will be issued this month. We now know it will actually be next month. Upon the issuance of these state regulations, DHS will finalize an updated transfer policy. We'd like to work with the sponsors to align the language in the proposed legislation with the OTDA requirements when they are promulgated. In conclusion, overall, the administration has made comprehensive and concerted efforts to address years of underinvestment in infrastructure of the shelter system with a combination of immediate investments and alongside top to bottom organizational improvement reforms. We've taken substantial steps towards improving the shelter system conditions by reducing the Giuliani era cluster program by more than 50%. And with this month's announcement that nearly 500 cluster units will become permanent affordable housing in early 2019, we remain on pace to end the cluster program by 2021. 
Further, the city has stepped up its efforts to use data and inform strategies to identify and address building code violations through the shelter repair squad, including utilizing sh the shelter repair scorecard to track the city's progress towards improving conditions in shelters. Our new systems, which allow a great deal of interagency collaboration, are complemented by the city's increase in funding that supports our historically underfunded not-for-profit partners to conduct maintenance and repairs within their shelters. There's still work to be done to address the decades of disinvestment in shelter infrastructure, and we remain committed to helping homeless families and individuals get back on their feet in a safe, secure, and clean environment. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify, and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I just have a, a few questions. I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues. Sure. Um, uh, first question is just about reporting. Um, uh, Local Law 19 of 1999 uh, requires quarterly reporting from DHS or HRA um, on uh, the breakdown of families with children in shelter, single adult shelters, adult families in uh, shelters by the type of uh, shelter that it is, tier two, non-tier two, assessment, general program, hotels, cluster sites, and so, so on and so forth, as well as uh, identifying each shelter um, here uh, by type. Um, we have this, this is the last one we were able to find. It was published on October 1st, 2015, so over three years ago. Um, we spoke about this briefly before the hearing. Uh, uh, can you explain what the status is on, uh, on DHS's compliance with local law 19 and 1999? I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this uh, right before the hearing. I think as we were reviewing with you, we've got um, uh, records of local law 19 reporting that, that we were reviewing with you. Uh, obviously, there must be dis some disconnect between our preparation of the reports and you, uh, what you've got, and we'll work that out with you. The information that's in this report is the type of information, for example, uh, during the executive budget process that we exchange with uh, the council finance team as part of working out the budget. So we're preparing the information. Uh, we've got uh, you know documents that show us that we've been providing it. We'll have to sort out with you to figure out what the disconnect is here, but this is not information that we have not uh, been providing, and we understand our obligation to continue to provide it. Okay. Um, along the same lines, there's um, the DHS data dashboard, uh, which is online on the DHS website, which also shows the last quarter that's posted online as quarter two of 2016, which would have been the same same date of October of uh, of 2015. Um, that's the last one that's that's online. So, that, is there an, um, a reason why that's not being and that, that's a kind of comprehensive view. It may be a little more user-friendly than Local Law 19, but I think gets at a lot of the same. Yeah, I, as I said when, when we spoke right before the hearing, I'm not sure what the disconnect is there. We obviously mm -hmm. have the data. We've been making it available to the council and in various hearings to, to the public. Uh, and if we've got an issue, we're certainly going to correct it because it's information we've been providing. Okay. Um, you spoke about the various types of shelter. Um, uh, obviously identifying, and this is something that was identified uh, by this administration early on and then um, identified repeatedly by DOI. Oh, sorry, before I get to that, Councilmember Brad Lander joined us as well, so I'm just not acknowledge Brad. Um, uh, um, this was acknowledged repeatedly by DOI, controller, uh, DHS itself through the 90-day review of, the, of <clears throat> uh, especially bad conditions in clusters. And if you look at the um, shelter repair scorecard, which I have up here on my phone, um, I mean, some of the most egregious uh, violators are, in fact, the, well, the most egregious violators are, um, are clusters. Um, you said that we were out of about 1,800 of them out of roughly 3,600, so about half. Do we have a date, a firm date, on when we think we will be out of all clusters entirely. I know there's a, the big announcement of converting to permanent housing, but uh, do, we have a, do we have data when, when clusters will, will be a thing of the past? Y yes, we do. And just I appreciate the opportunity to um, uh, provide you some additional information. So we're out of 1,800 of the units, uh, and there are nearly uh, 500 additional families that will uh, receive permanent housing as a result of this recent conversion. Uh, we've set out the date of, uh, of getting out of them all by the end of 2021. 
Uh, but as we announced a year ago, in addition to simply getting out of them, uh, we're seeing it whenever we can convert them into permanent housing in the first major transaction we reported earlier this month. So the firm deadline is uh, uh, the end of 2021, but we're, we're well on a pace to achieve that, and we're achieving it through, uh, as you can see this month, beginning to convert units into permanent housing. So we, we heard that uh, in order to be eligible for one of those converted permanent units, a family has to be eligible in some way or be, be determined to be eligible for the rent-stabilized housing is what I was told. Can you explain a little bit of the requirements how a family um, uh, could, could uh, stay in the apartment if they chose to? Sh sure. Uh, and, what, and what would prohibit that? Sure. I think as, as when we announced this last December, I, I said that uh, we wanted to make sure that the families that were in these units, if they're eligible for supportive housing, that they would be connected to supportive housing. Uh, and that was one part of the analysis. Okay. We wanted to make sure that uh, the families were eligible for one of our rental assistance programs. We expect uh, most of the families to do that. But equally important, and, and I know you know this because you've been very focused on this, some of the units that the families are in, we need to make sure it's the right size for the family. So we don't want a family of five staying in a you know, one bedroom unit as their permanent housing. So it's, sure. an, it's an iterative process, the reason why we announced uh, the transaction uh, this, at the stage it was uh, a couple of weeks ago is because we we have begun to reach out to the families to make sure that we're right-sizing th uh, them to the units, to make sure that being in that particular location is the right thing for that particular family, to make sure that there aren't supportive housing needs or other needs for the families. I don't know where the term eligible for rent-stabilized housing comes, but uh, I appreciate the opportunity to dispel that. Mm -hmm. Every family that remains will get a rent-stabilized lease, and the permanent tenants, and these are buildings in which there are permanent tenants mm -hmm. as well, will also receive a, a, a permanent uh, lease. Altogether, including the f families that are in the cluster units, or in these buildings, I should say, and uh, the families that are permanent tenants, there's like more than 700 households that are gonna end up with rent-stabilized leases and permanently affordable housing. So the only barriers to somebody staying in the permanent house, being in, staying in one of these uh, converted permanent units uh, would be if they chose not to, if they otherwise are qualifying for supportive housing, uh, if it's not the right size for their family composition, or, um, or they're, if they're not in the, it's not in the neighborhood that they should be in? That they want to be in. But they want to be in. Okay. Uh, and also there are some... If, in other words, I, I, the question I ask is kind of, if they want to stay there, what are the hurdles? Uh, I think there, there is another hurdle that I wanted to mention. You've, you've highlighted each of them, and there's one more I want to <laughs> add, which is that uh, families, there are some families that need additional services in shelter, and it may be a better outcome for the family to be connected to a Tier 2 shelter rather than to... Uh, end up in a, in a part where they may not be, they may not need supportive housing, but they may, may need other supportive her, uh, services. But I well, want to emphasize, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm if, sorry. Okay. if I could just finish, sure. this is really a case-by-case -case determination, which is the reason why, as I said, we announced uh, that we were beginning to re outreach to the families, mm -hmm. so that we're very transparent about what we're doing. And we'll keep you advised about what the ultimate outcomes are. Our goal is to enable as many families as possible to remain in, in their unit or in a unit in these buildings, if possible. Okay. Sorry, you mentioned that if they were better served in a Tier 2, that's, a Tier 2 is not a permanent housing option. And, I mean, my rejoinder to that would be that we should have reasonable aftercare wraparound services available to families when they get into permanent housing whether that's in a converted cluster or in a affordable housing unit that will be as part of a 15% set aside or, uh, or uh, placed through a city FAPS or link um, or, or some other program, a Section 8 program, but that we should be thinking fo moving forward I and mean, we should be forward thinking about um, about af appropriate aftercare services that we can contract with our so great social service providers that we uh, rely on so heavily. Right, I think you make a great point. We are very forward looking here. In these buildings, there will be uh, uh, directly provided social services. 
but I think, as you know, they're, they're, the one-size-fits-all approach of the past hasn't worked so well. There are a continuum of needs that our clients have. The vast majority of clients that are in these buildings, we hope, will be able to remain in these buildings. The great thing about you know a robust aftercare program would be that it would be one size fits all. And, you know, partnering with a, you know a great or community-based organization that has various city contracts with very various agencies that are you know working with children you know from birth to 18 and seniors and workforce development and all those great things that all of our not-for-profit partners do. If that could be partnered as an aftercare for people that have uh, left the shelter system, I think you know that would be a good fit. You must be reading my mind. That's exactly what we're intending to do here. Okay, so it should pair though with 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 these uh, critical clusters. Uh, again, we want to we want to reach out to each individual family, okay, and not make uh, policy in a broad brush when there may be individual needs that are different. But as a general matter, we want to make sure the apartment is the right size for the mm -hmm. family, and that the family uh, uh, wants to and can remain in that in their unit. Okay, I don't want to belabor the point. Um, we have, uh, I'm looking at the shelter, shelter scorecard, um, shelter repair scorecard, and it's, um, what I am seeing is viol the worst violators are the clusters. Uh, a lot of tier twos have low level of violations, and I think a lot of that is, is to longstanding capital needs that, um, that they were talking about. Um, to me, my very first meeting that I had with shelter providers uh, and becoming chair five years ago, six years, five years ago, um, six years ago. That was that um, uh, uh, f five years ago. Excuse me, I'm losing track here. Five. F um, that um, uh, that the long-term deferred capital repairs was causing a lot of problems for a lot of shelter providers, particularly the tier twos. And so I can see why they would have ongoing violations if they're related to, to capital projects. I did notice a number of hotels that had uh, a surprisingly high number of open violations. One had 77, another had 48. Um, you know, I, I don't have to list all of them, but um, uh, that's, that's disturbing. Uh, why would a hotel have 77 open violations and we would still be in contract with them? So can you speak to that? So, so, let, me, so let me speak overall to to what you're highlighting. Um, so currently in the non-clusters, there are about 1,600 violations, and, and I know you, you've probably done this. If you look at it over time, you'll see some number of those violations are exactly related, a couple, several hundred of them are exactly related to what you described, which they're long-term capital projects. They're not immediately hazardous, they're not dangerous, but they do require capital work mm -hmm. uh, to repair them. And as you can see, we've allocated a significant amount of money to begin to address these, these uh, years of, as you say, and I said in the testimony, years of disinvestment. There's another uh, series of, of violations that you'll see, and it's, it's in both hotels and tier two shelters alike, which is just the wear and tear. Uh, we have, uh, you know, 60,000 plus people in shelter, but there's, that's not a, the same 60,000 people on any given night. And so we have a lot of wear and tear in these units. And part of the benefit of, of what we've been doing is we've been addressing the wear and tear. And that hasn't been addressed for many years. There are other violations in the hotels and, and, other, and some of the tier twos as well that are not wear and tear. And we're focusing on the individual providers and the individual landlords to address that. Um, you okay, I'm not here to out anybody um, about, so if, if anyone's interested in it, go to the DHS website and you can find out who has the most violations. Um, but um, there's a range, so there are some hotels that have, uh, you know, have as low as a couple, you know, eight, one, two, five, seven, and then some have 77 or 48. So I just don't understand, that's not really where, I mean, that's not wear and tear. That's that's real. That's really problematic. Right. You have these ongoing contracts with these uh, organizations. As I said, I want to be careful. Uh, I'm not disagreeing. With you. I want to be careful of how you're characterizing what I'm saying, though, which is that there's capital repairs, there's wear and tear, and then I said there's a third category of of, of conditions that we take seriously. Remember, these are violations uh, that could be building wide. They could be not a particular unit that we're in. So. Uh, we're addressing uh, all of these issues constantly every month. It's a lot. These buildings are. Okay, I would. I'm sorry, just not to cut you off. I could just finish, Councilmember. Sure. Yeah. So, 
these are buildings that are being inspected more than any other buildings in New York City, and they should be because mm -hmm. we, we've got uh, families with children and, uh, and adults that turn to us for help in our buildings. Uh, we're inspecting them twice a year with a multi-agency task force and pushing the owners to make corrections. I think, I think as you'll see over time, we've gotten out of buildings where we thought we couldn't get them corrected. There are you know, several that come to mind that we've gotten out of very recently because the shelter repair squad mm -hmm. uh, report cards, uh, inspections plus scorecard didn't result in remediation. So for example, we got out of Clara's uh, hotel uh, in, um, out near uh, Councilmember Traeger's uh, district, not in it, but near it, uh, because we felt that ultimately we couldn't get, the shelter repair squad ap approach wasn't working. We got out of a, a location named The Ping because we thought that the shelter repair, uh, uh, so we're, we're actively getting out of places even as we're trying to fix them up. But if a hotel has you know, dozens and dozens of violations, um, I mean, I'd, I could go back and try to find out how long they've had their contract, how long they've been open, but you know, presumably not 20 years. They're not like tier twos that opened in the mid 90s and have had you know a decade or two of capital. So, I, so if a, if, a, if a hotel has a hotels not you know generally they were built to be hotels or they were rehabbed to be hotels. They converted. Um, so I just don't I just don't understand why a hotel would have 77 violations um, because the contract probably hasn't gone on for you know 20 years and it was built to be a hotel and it's not like some old rent stabilized building that was built in like 1950 that's like you know had 60 70 years of uh, of capital deferred maintenance and stuff. Look, I, I, I'm not I'm not disputing your concerns. I'm, I'm trying to uh, make it clear on the record that unlike at the time of the DOI report mm -hmm. and the time of the original controller's report, we've been actively getting out of sites, whether they're clusters or commercial hotels, we've been actively getting out of sites where we have found that enforcement and inspections have not gotten the results we want. Okay. The flip side of it is the trauma of moving lots of people out of a location and finding another place to put them. So we're right. balancing both making sure that the conditions meet the standards by aggressively inspecting and getting out of locations that we think uh, we can't achieve results. And so, I'll certainly look at the site that you're referencing, mm -hmm. uh, and we can talk, uh, as we always do, offline to yeah. see what we can sure. do with any particular sites that are of concern to you. Also a concern is, you know, uh, two years ago there were two little sisters who were killed um, by a, a malfunctioning radiator um, at a cluster site in the Bronx. It was very tragic. Um, and I think, I think about those that family a lot. Um, I think that we announced as a city that we were going to discontinue our contracts with that provider. I, I'm looking up just now on that report card. I think that I saw their name still there as a provider of cluster with a lot of violations attached to those buildings. They're, they're, not, a there. they're not a provider of clusters. Uh, the reference that you have is the sites still have their name attached to it because uh, we, we, we got out of their buildings. They're not a cluster provider. I was in that apartment with Council Member Salamanca and the mayor. Uh, if you, whether you, I have children, whether you have children or not, you couldn't possibly uh, uh, not uh, be utterly heartbroken by that. Mm -hmm. uh, Bedco is not a cluster provider. The sites are still referenced to I the see. fact that they were there. Okay. Uh, that was a horrible situation in that building. Uh, the city had been renting two units in that building as clusters, and there were nearly 40 total apartments in that building. Mm -hmm. uh, but we removed the families right away from that building uh, and ended, uh, ended the, the, the use of, of Bedco. So I want to okay. assure you. So the reference on the, sh on the scorecard is, is to the is site, not to the provider. OK, fair enough. Um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues, Councilmember Barry Grudenchik, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, just to be clear, we're talking about clusters. These are cluster sites that you're at, that you're referring to. Correct. So the yes. reference is to the cluster site, not to the, not the uh, not Bedco still being the provider there. Yeah, I was referring to the cluster sites. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I was answering the question correctly. Thank you. It's always good to see you, Commissioner. Good to see you too. Um, and I appreciate the work you're doing, but I would be less than honest if I told you that. You know, I, I just feel like we're on a treadmill, and I know you're working hard, and um, it just is very disappointing to me that the numbers are not going down, and I, I realize there are any number of issues 
Um, but we have just way too many people living in our shelter system. It's not healthy for them. It's certainly not healthy um, for the 22,000 young people. Um, my question for you, and you and I have talked about this before, um, Assemblyman Hevesy and uh, Push Forward in Albany, and I will continue to support him, uh, home stability support. And I wonder if you could talk about that and what it might mean um, for the people living in the shelter system in New York City and how that might help them. Uh, thank you very much for the question, uh, because the home stability support uh, initiative, it's now co-sponsored with Senator Kruger in the Senate uh, and with Assemblymember Hevesy in the uh, Assembly. That would make a tremendous difference. Uh, just to be clear for the record what it would do, it would set uh, uh, rental assistance at um, the, uh, in, in, in relationship to the federal uh, uh, fair market rent set by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, and it would uh, provide uh, state reimbursement to New York City for its programs. Uh, the recently streamlined rental assistance programs, we are running those with city dollars. Uh, so it would provide, uh, we believe, a more comprehensive approach than we're able to provide as a city. And of equal importance, it would provide a portable benefit so that uh, New Yorkers could use that rental assistance any place in New, York, in New York State. I think, as you know, we have clients that are seeking to pursue other opportunities in the state uh, and that we can only give them one time. may be one of them soon, but go ahead. No, not we, too can soon. <laughs> we can only give them one time, a one time upfront uh, a year's worth of rent payment. We cannot pay ongoing rent. The Home Stability Support Initiative would create a portable benefit. So if someone wished uh, to relocate uh, where family might be or where other opportunities might be, they could do that. We have lots of clients that want to do that. They're not being forced to do it, but we do have clients who are interested in doing it. So in terms of rent level, reimbursement, and portability in New York State, it would make a dramatic difference across the state in terms of homelessness. It's the reason why uh, we have supported the have C legislation. Uh, we are in regular contact with him. And I know that the chair of this committee uh, feels very strongly about this initiative, and we think it's a very important uh, effort that both the council and the administration can work on together. I, uh, I appreciate that very much. Um, I have been a supporter since, even before I talked to the assemblyman, I read about it, I think it was in the Daily News, and uh, we'll be meeting on that shortly. I'm uh, delighted that, uh, without getting political, that. Senator Kruger in a few days will be the Senate Finance Chair, and I hope that uh, will go a long way um, toward passing this legislation and providing uh, real teeth um, for people who are struggling to find uh, affordable housing. Um, I have seen, um, anecdotally and otherwise, on the subways, I'm a regular subway user, as many of my colleagues are, uh, it's just been a tremendous uptick, especially on the lines I, I ride, the E and the F um, from Queens into Lower Manhattan uh, several times a week. And a number of homeless people, or uh, apparently homeless, I don't want to categorize people just in case, um, but I, I just wanted to know what you're doing, what your agency is doing and, um, to uh, talk to these people. I know um, that you have outreach programs, if you could talk about that for a little bit. Sure, thank you for that question as well. Um, I, I referenced it earlier in the testimony, I just want to return to it, that since we implemented the Homestead program, we've been able to bring two, more than 2,000 people in off the street who have remained off the street. And I emphasize that second part, have remained off the street. Too often, the metric is bring somebody off the street, and then if they go back, uh, they're back on the street. We're very focused on successful outcomes that help people transform their circumstances. So more than 2,000 people since 2016 have been able to bring off who have remained off the street, either in transitional programs or in uh, permanent housing. Um, we, uh, we, 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 where we originally brought them. Uh, we contract with uh, uh, BRC, a reputable, excellent provider to be doing outreach on the subways. I know they're very focused on the E-Train. Uh, and as well as the A-Train. I know um, your colleague, 
um, who represents the area in Jamaica, uh, raised this with me. I was out there with them to see if we could work together with the MTA and with the NYPD. There's a tremendous amount of cooperation. I know the NYPD with Chief Del Torre has been very focused in working uh, with BRC. Um, and we're gonna continue what we do every day uh, and every night, uh, uh, 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year, try to make contact with people and bring them in. Um, it takes an average of five months uh, once we've made contact with somebody who's willing to accept our services to actually be able to convince them to make that leap. I think as you know from all the work you've done that you know the people on the subways and on the streets have fallen through every social safety net we have. They're caught up in that same those same economic forces uh, that Chairperson Levin and I talked about and you raised in terms of the gap between rents and income. I mean, in a, in a world in which uh, for a decade plus, rents went up nearly 19% and income less than 5%, these are individuals caught up in that economic for, uh, those economic circumstances, plus mental health challenges that they have. Uh, but we have teams that are licensed to assess individuals under the mental hygiene law standards to see if they're a danger to themselves or others. Uh, various of our teams provide medical services. We're doing anything to try to bring people in. I guess I have to make a pitch. There was recently a, a case in which it uh, really illustrated the work that we do every day of the week, which is it sort of takes a village to bring somebody in from the street. There was someone who had been a rapper uh, a number of years ago, uh, actually cut a record, had gone to college, and then had a breakdown, ended up on the streets. And it was by a social worker in a hospital working with our team, connected him to his childhood friends. And they made the difference to help us penetrate to bring him off the streets. He's living in supportive housing now. But it's a, it's a, it's a important message for all New Yorkers. If you've got family, if you've got friends, if you know somebody on the street, reach out to us and we will work with you. Maybe you can be part of the support system to help us bring somebody back in. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember Grudenchik. Uh, so just, uh, colleagues, I just want to let you know that we'll be doing five minutes for questions and then <clears throat> you didn't go too far over, right? Yeah. Uh, but we will, uh, we, we'll do second rounds if we need to as well. So. Um, next up, Council Member uh, Salamanca. Thank you, um, Chair Levin. Uh, Commissioner, it's great to see you. Um, Commissioner, uh, my, um, today I introduced Bill 9915, which would require uh, DHS and HRA to um, report um, quarterly to community boards and community boards um, and online and council members um, and online to report on a quarterly basis how many uh, shelters uh, they have uh, broken down by singles, family, um, you know, all transitional housing, and also uh, to give a breakdown of uh, supportive housing, you know, um, um, buildings throughout their district and cluster sites. Is this, does, do you currently have this data broken down? Can you go, go and request this from your office and they can come back within an hour and provide you with this data? So some of, So, so some of the data uh, we do have, and we, and we have been providing it to council members and community boards as we open sites. Some other data we don't have totally in our control. For example, uh, supportive housing, there are state supportive housing uh, projects that we, we don't have visibility into. But I wanna just say, as I've said to you privately and many times before, I appreciate your initiative here. And I think we've worked out a lot of different legislative challenges in the past, and I'm, I'm looking at Councilmember Torres, who we had some complicated bill negotiations not so long ago when we came to a great resolution. I want to work with you to get to a place where you can achieve the goals that you want with the bill, and we can do something that's feasible for us, that's meaningful for the communities. All right. Um, is, it, is it fair to say that there are certain community boards or council districts which are doing more than their fair share when it comes to siting of transitional housing? Um, if I may answer that question in a slightly different way, I think one of the important pieces of turning the tide is to look at it from a client's perspective of where can we reconnect people to in terms of the anchors of their lives. So schools, jobs, healthcare, uh, houses of worship, family and friends, those are important anchors of all of our lives. And for too long the shelter system operated where you'd be like in another borough and your, your child was going to school someplace exactly. else. So we're very focused, and I think this actually is complementary to what you want to accomplish, 
on making sure that people have the opportunity to be housed as close as possible to those connections, and the shelter system isn't developed that way. It's developed in which certain communities, there's no way if you become homeless there can you be rehoused there, and in other communities there are more opportunities than than are needed in a particular district. So we're trying to right-size need and rehousing all around the city, and I think there's a consistency between what you're trying to accomplish. I think you've seen we've opened shelters and community boards and uh, proposed to site them in areas where there have never been shelters before. And we think that's important to give uh, clients the opportunity to be, to be sheltered as close as possible to important connections. Thank you. I uh, recently introduced a 15% homeless set-aside <laughs> bill, which would which the mayor is totally not in favor of. Um, however, we are in a homeless crisis, and I think that the mayor and his administration are totally blinded on the issue. Commissioner, is the administration giving you the support that you need to address homelessness? Is the mayor really aware that there are 63 in, over 63,000 individuals that are sleeping in a shelter bed, 23,000 of them our children. When was the last time you had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the mayor on this topic? Uh, we talk all the time. I know there's a lot of reports that such conversations don't happen. Uh, we meet on a regular basis. I believe that probably some records have been released sometime about how often we talk, but I can assure you it's frequently. I also want to say that there are tools that the mayor has given me that no social services commissioner in New York City has ever had before. Let's just go, th go through them. Prevention, universal access to counsel, reducing evictions by 27% already. This is a tool that no social services commissioner had before I've got it now. The rent arrears payments that I've been authorized to, to make, a level never, never been done before by a social services commissioner. The programs that we're using that I talked about with council member Grudenchik about bringing people in off the streets the tripling of the investments for safe haven beds, which is a critical tool to bring people in from the streets. The rental assistance and other programs that I've been given to rehouse uh, more than 100,000 people as a social services commissioner through our programs. And then the ability to close, close down more than 180 shelter locations over the last year and begin to site new shelters. So I've been given a lot of tools that no other social services commissioner has had to try to address uh, this very, very uh, 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 troubling situation. All right. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll come back around for round two to respect the time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Reynoso, no longer here. Uh, also, we've been joined, by the way, by Councilmember Mark Traeger, Keith Powers, and Richie Torres. Next, Councilmember Diana Ayala. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioner. <clears throat> I'm actually really excited to be here because I think that there's a lot of conversation to be had around this issue. Um, you know, when I was five years old, I had a fire in my building and we were displaced and I ended up in a shelter uh, just a few blocks from where I lived. And that was very beneficial to my family because it allowed my mother to keep her children in the, in the local schools. It allowed us to stay next to fa near family and around our support system. So I am very much in favor of keeping com um, families in their communities. I think that we could be helpful, more helpful to you, if there was a more transparent process by which we're doing this. So instead of coming and, and, and placing a shelter for the sake of keeping families, if we understood holistically what that means, what is the impact to this community? How many shelters do we have? How many are we transitioning out? How, what is the, the plan for ensuring that communities are coming, that families are coming back to their communities, that that would really help me? So just, you know, just something that, you know, hopefully you can, you know, keep in mind. Um, I wonder, however, in terms of the voucher system process, is there a tracking mechanism that DHS uses to uh, determine how many vouchers are going out and how many are being denied? Um, and if so, is, there, is DHS then also reporting these landlords for declining the use of these uh, vouchers, which is in clear violation of the law? Uh, first of all, thank you for your comment about shelter setting. Overall, you've been a great partner. I should say this for the sake of everybody. It doesn't mean you always say, hey, I agree with you. I think that's an important part of a relationship. You've been a good partner uh, in terms of the things we're trying to accomplish for you and your district. And you've also pushed back when you thought that something that I was proposing wasn't going to work. And I, I, that's a, I appreciate having that kind of working relationship with you. 
in terms of uh, the vouchers, we, we set up a source of income discrimination unit at HRA, and we've already sued two landlords uh, in significant cases that we think uh, could affect other landlord behavior. Uh, we set up that unit because we see what you see on the ground, which is despite the fact that there's a local law uh, that makes it illegal to discriminate on the basis of source of income, uh, too many of our clients were reporting back to us that uh, there is such discrimination. I went to too many town halls. I spoke with too many focus group of clients, and that's why we set up the unit to bring cases, and we're hopeful that the precedents that will be established in those cases will have an impact on any additional landlords uh, who continue to violate the law. And we're ready to bring other cases as well. How, how old is the unit? I don't, I don't I, I, I how old is, how long have you had that unit? Uh, we set it up uh, over the last year, and we've brought two significant cases already, and we're ready to bring more cases. Do you, do you know how many cases have come before that unit? How many complaints have you received? Uh, the, I, I'm, uh, I'm not being articulate on this. The cases are impact cases that we brought based upon individual complaints. So we wanted to evaluate the individual complaints to see which, which uh, matters would, would enable us to have the greatest impact on the market. And so that's why we were given the authority to bring affirmative cases. There are also complaints that are made to the Human Rights Commission as well uh, by individual clients. What we have done is we've distributed uh, a number to make it clear, and we can make it available again to all council members to uh, suggest that clients call our hotline, and then we can evaluate whether or not we might be able to bring an affirmative lawsuit against the landlord that could benefit other families. Are the caseworkers uh, providing this information to the clients directly? We've, we've created a flyer to be distributed, and we, we constantly put it out there. We'll, we're, we're, you know, we're certainly going to do it again to make sure that people are calling us so that we can take action. I mean, I think it's beneficial because then it allows you to I act agree. in real time. I agree. In regards to fair share, um, is there an analysis that DHS currently uses to place, uh, to site a shelter? Um, I bring it up because I have three cases in, you know, in mind. 125th Street and Lexington Avenue was undergoing a very serious synthetic marijuana issue a couple of years ago. Um, there were a lot of complications that were happening there because we were inundated with methadone clinics. We have, you know, the M35, which is the only way in and out of Wards Island. So you have a thousand men that were coming onto 116th Street, but this shelter specifically was on 124th Street for men with mental health issues. And every single time that they opened their door, they were exposed to all type of things that I'm sure was not conducive to their mental health well-being. And I wonder if anybody is reporting that and reassessing the place of these specific sites because when you cite a shelter for families and you cite a, a safe haven or a shelter for men with mental health issues they're very specific needs that need to be addressed and so I wonder if the city and has an analysis of what is in that community I'll give you another example 146 Street give me one second uh, mr. chair 146 Street in the Bronx I have a safe haven which you know I, I appreciate I know that we need them right directly across the street from a church that also houses a daycare. The community, that, that whole block is littered with needles because obviously this safe haven is occupied by primarily uh, dr active drug users. Uh, did anybody at some point highlight that there was a daycare right across the street and that maybe for this particular type of shelter setting, this was not an appropriate location? Right. I think, uh, as, as you know, we look at uh, the new shelters that we're citing with an eye towards what are the surrounding services and what benefits can we give to clients and what, how do we be a good neighbor when we cite shelters. Um, I think one of the challenges of the opioid crisis is that it's not uh, all associated with our clients, but there are issues in the communities. I know there are needle exchanges um, in, in some of the areas up uh, by what you're describing. And I do agree with you that we have to make sure that we have the maximum amount of coordination uh, to avoid pr the kinds of problems that you're highlighting. I just wanted to add that I, I would never imply that it was solely coming from the, the safe haven, but I will say that I know for, for sure that 90% of it was because I staked that community. Like I literally sat there at least once a week mm -hmm. at different times of the day throughout the whole summer and the amount of active drug use that I was seeing, people were literally injecting themselves right in the middle of the street 
right across the street from the daycare center. Many of the parents witnessed it, many of the families witnessed it, and then it trickled into the public park so that now my community residents could no longer use that public park, and I had to police it because there was no way that we could allow children to continue to be in an environment where people were actively injecting themselves. And so we wanna be helpful on both fronts. My committee, you know, I, this is what I do, and I, I struggle with that, and I understand, but I think that the city is doing a disservice to these communities by not really thoroughly assessing it. when a prime uh, you know, piece of real estate becomes available, you shouldn't just take it and decide, well, this is the, you know, I'm gonna put it here because this is the only place I have left. There has to be a, a, a better analysis of, of where you're putting. Yeah, no, I, and again, I appreciate your partnership on this. You're, you're focusing on us. We got the NYPD involved. It raised a lot of issues and I, and I appreciate your focus on it. I think, one of the things I wanna highlight again is I sent a letter out to every community board and every council member uh, last year at the one year mark of the turn of the tide uh, saying here's what we've accomplished in a year. We could use help to identify other sites. Some uh, members who are here uh, and uh, members who are not here have been tremendously helpful in helping us identify sites using exactly the lens that you just described and I appreciate that kind of help because uh, it makes for better, uh, better uh, services for our clients and for everybody else. Thank you, Councilmember Ayala. Councilmember Mark Jonai. Thank you, Chair. Good to see you again, Commissioner. I just want to elaborate um, a bit on my colleague's question when it comes to the breakdown of supported housing units and why you can't give an answer, but yet we have a fair share reporting that clearly identifies the number of supportive housing units by borough. Right, the issue is, I, as I said to Councilmember Salamanca, there are supportive housing units that are state run that I don't have visibility into. I don't think it's that difficult to get the answers between the city and the state to figure out the number of supportive housing units. Our own reporting in 2017 shows the borough of the Bronx is inundated uh, compared to the rest of the city. We have 41% more supportive housing units than Brooklyn, 99% more than Queens, 100% more than Staten Island, and 13% more than Manhattan. That came out of the New York City. Just to, and, and we know each other going back to your Albany Times mm -hmm. and my time at Legal Aid. I just wanna make sure it's clear for the record, supportive housing is permanent affordable housing. And permanent affordable housing, I know, is what this committee and the council wants the government to be doing, and I, I think it's very important to focus on it as affordable housing as opposed to shelters for homeless people. And so I don't. Want, I want to make sure for anybody listening. I know you know. I know you know this. I just want to make sure for the record, for anybody listening, that supportive housing is permanent affordable housing, and the shelters that we're citing, the 90 new shelters, 29 of which are already cited, uh, 19 up and uh, 18 up and operating. That's replacing 360 shelters, and so I want to make sure we have apples to oranges here. All right, but not even cluster sites is information that we're given. It is about transparency. We wanted to know what exists by borough, by council district, by community board. Shouldn't be as difficult as going to the dentist, for God's sake, and pulling a tooth. Right. It's about information. Right. Of course, I would just say much of that information is actually in the fair share documents that I send to, to council members specifying how many sites are in, the, are in the district and most of the, and particularly the recent fair share uh, documents that I've been submitting say, for example, there are X number of clusters and they're all going to close by the end of the year in this particular district or there are X number of commercial hotels they're going to close. So I, I share your concern about transparency and that's why we've been doing it that way. Commissioner, the voucher program, can you um, illustrate for us what the breakdown is for a studio apartment, a one bedroom and a two bedroom? So, rental assistant dollar amounts. Right, so um, I, I wanna make sure that I get the amounts right, so I'm gonna use approximate numbers because mm -hmm. I'm under oath and I wanna make sure I get the right amount. So typically for a family of four, we're able to pay uh, just north of $1,500. For a two bedroom, uh, again, or is that for a one bedroom? Because family of four, oh, typically for a, for a family of an adult and a child, we're able to provide north of $1,200. And these are amounts that are set through or are aligned with the amounts that were set through the Tejada litigation. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the city rental assistance 
uh, voucher levels were consistent with the state uh, uh, FEPS levels. But I want to just go back to Councilmember Gordensch's questions. This is why the housing stability support legislation is so important because it would align the rental assistance levels to the uh, Department of uh, Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development FMR levels, and I know that that's why uh, Assemblymember Hevesy and, and Senator Kruger are supporting that. But and we isn't are that the problem that one size fits all is the real issue, and that's why those families that are out there with vouchers can't find apartments because a $1,500 apartment in New York City limits you to the borough and neighborhoods. You're not going to get Park Slope $1,500 for a two-bedroom apartment, I would imagine. Uh, we, 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 yeah. we're, we're very focused on not so much whether you can live in Park Slope or not, but whether or not the amount of money we give you is something that is sustainable in the city budget, and wouldn't it be better for the uh, kruger Hevesy legislation to pass, which would give appropriate reimbursement to the city for what we're already but doing? But even there, the rental assistance program is one size fits all, and that'll be a limit based on the number of bedrooms as far as the voucher dollar amount is associated to. You're not going to get a one bedroom in Rochester for the same amount in New York City, and you're certainly not going to pay the same amount in the borough of the Bronx as you would in Park Slope, is my argument. That markets determine market rate. And if we don't come up with a voucher system or a rental assistance program which looks into the markets themselves to determine what the voucher should be. So if you are a homeless person that's lived your whole life in Brooklyn Park Slopes, giving you a $1,500 voucher for a two-bedroom, saying, you know, it's best that you stay in a community where your house of worship is, where your children go to that school, uh, here's what we can do for you, does not work. And I'm just going to, because I know times of concern, that's also the problem with our support of housing and shelters. You're paying the same income to these developers and operators citywide. So if I'm getting the same income as an operator of a shelter, What's going to be the determining factor on where I build my shelter? Land acquisition and construction costs. And guess where both of those are the lowest? In the beautiful borough of the Bronx. Hence the inundation that's going to continue because of the lower property values and construction costs compared to many parts of the city. And we're not getting ahead of it. I we're allowing this to continue, and we're not serving the people that need the service and keeping them in their communities, and we're allowing boroughs to be hurt. I, I compliment and applaud my council, my colleague, for breaking it down by council district, but the problem is a whole borough view, because what happens in his backyard is my front yard, and it impacts us all because it's the same infrastructure from health care the limited HHC hospitals that we have serve the entire borough. Same for the police department and board of ed. And we don't have the safety nets and the resources that are needed to be supportive of these very needy families. Well, I think you're right about the importance of a citywide approach, which again is what the Turn of the Tide plan is aimed at doing. If you look at the first 29 shelters that we've cited, uh, there have been shelters cited in communities that never had shelters before, and stay tuned as we proceed. We've been very clear, for example, when we close all the commercial hotels in Queens that we're going to need to uh, uh, fill a gap of need for the numbers of people who become homeless from Queens, and similarly with Staten Island. So you'll look, look at the first 29 that we've done, and we have more to do. Uh, we have a lot more to do, but I think we're, we've grabbed the bull by the uh, tail and not the horns. And I guess to get ahead of this and prevent the numbers from getting worse when it comes to our homeless families, keeping families in their current home should be the objective. This is triage, stop the bleeding. And I, I, I implore you to look at the tree bill, which operates similar to the scree and the dre. Families earning under $50,000 a year should not be facing any renewal lease increases it should be credited to the landlord on their real estate taxes, securing that at least the rent is not going to increase for these very vulnerable families so they don't find themselves homeless and displaced. 
it would be wise money spent. We'll, we'll certainly look at that bill. As we have for a number of years, but it's not going anywhere because there's no inclination from this administration to really do what needs to be done. And that is keeping people in their homes and protecting the most vulnerable. Families making less than $50,000 a year. If it works for our seniors, it works for our disabled, it's good enough for the working families out there that are suffering day in and day out. Well, I just for the record want to make it clear though, there's been a tremendous investment in preventing homelessness. That's why evictions by marshals are down 27% because of the provision of legal services and the provision of rent arrears. But you're absolutely right, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Sorry, Chairman, this warrants a response. I understand that, but this is capping rents. It's making sure that the rent doesn't become more unaffordable for these families. For the net, you, it, the projection I was given for five years based on the models that we currently have and the RGB increases since their inception, it would cost New York City $300 million over five years. That would prevent a tremendous amount of families from losing their homes. That would be grabbing the bull by the horns, controlling the bleeding, so then we can perform the triage and make sure that we have permanent housing solutions for those that need it. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Joni. Uh, Councilmember Keith Powers. I can't follow up with that. Um, thank you for <laughs> thank you for your testimony. I, I, wa I wanted to ask some things about conditions, but I wanted to ask first. You talked about source of income sure. and discrimination. I had actually, I don't know, maybe 12 years ago, worked on a bill in Albany to increase source of uh, source of income discrimination protections for tenants. The city actually at that time, I believe, advocated and it was vetoed. Um, again, advocated because it wasn't consistent with New York City law. It, are there other areas in right now that you believe that there could be protections around source of income, whether it's size of size of buildings, other forms of uh, income that are not being that are not pr currently protected? Th that's an excellent question. Um, I think that our perspective is making sure the existing law is uh, is enforced. Uh, and that's why we set up the unit HRA to supplement what the Human Rights Commission does. Um, I had forgotten that you were involved in the other uh, bill, but I, l perhaps we, let, let's look. I would let's sit down and look at it together to see sure. what might be a good thing, uh, what, what we might be able to do um, to, to move this further. Um, as I said earlier, I heard from too many clients directly at town halls, I know you're gonna have one uh, this week, and, and in other settings that people have raised to me this problem, which is why we set up the unit, but it's it's a significant concern to me. Okay, thank you. Um, the, just on the topic, the, con, you know, the concern that I think one might have as we're citing is that uh, we have a, an obvious need, 63,000 folks, and pr probably actually more than that, who are experiencing homelessness at, I guess, any given moment, and the annual numbers are higher, but that the citing of those will, I mean, as we talk about where the best, as help working with folks to try to identify the best places to keep them connected to their community, work, or whatever the other conditions we wanna do, the, you know, that essentially, as I understand it, the provider comes up with a lease and identifies a site, brings it to the city, the city then evaluates. Can, but I want to just get a clearer sense of the process that is used for identifying the sites that you're opening as the 29 that you've done and the ones going forward in terms of understanding how those are identified, um, how many maybe have been brought to the city and have been rejected based on concerns around they don't meet the mission, safety, conditions. Um, how many have been closed based for those same, same reasons? And then I think there's a question that's come up from many times in different instances, which is the idea to do a lease with a provider versus outright buying sites based on the cost consideration to the city. And, um, and I think that you know, a lot of folks ask, have asked me and others about this entire process of picking and siting, because it doesn't, in my experience, it doesn't actually include saying are there other available sites that might meet the same goal in the neighborhood or in the community. I, don't, I do believe we all have to take on our share, and, but I don't think there's a process by which there is, we can bring them to you, but I don't think there's sort of a discussion around, okay, we have other available sites here as well, might be more beds, might be more, uh, meet the mission more. So I, I hope you could walk us through that process and then maybe give us some data on um, how, how this process works and what 
have been ones that have been turned away for condition concerns. Sure. No, I'm happy to do that. I, I want to just tell a story before I give you a direct answer, okay. but I also want to thank you. And I think, frankly, the New York Times acknowledged uh, your uh, leadership um, on, the, on exactly this issue. So you're somebody that puts your principles uh, where, where, you're, where, you're, where you are, and I really appreciate that. Um, but let me give you an, an example that's a good example. So um, I can talk about Council Member Cohen because he's not here. So Council Member Cohen, uh, uh, you know, had said that there were some of the same concerns that you just raised about how setting happens. And he came to us with a site that we could get up right away that was a great site and it's a good example of what can be done. We've had other, and I don't want to embarrass everybody, we've had other interactions with Council Member Torres, for example, where we've really talked through, hey, there's a particular provider that makes sense in this community and they want to do something in this community. Does that make sense to you? And so to me, these are examples, and yourself included and others here, where there's been a back and forth that has made the citing process not perfect, but a much better one in many respects. And so again, that was the spirit in which I sent this letter last year, and I'll you know, assume I'll do it again, but sort of updating people on where we're at and asking for sites, because if people have sites uh, that we can get up quickly, this is a great thing. Uh, the, system, this, the process works very simply. Uh, after we released uh, the Turn of the Tide report, we called uh, the providers in for a large meeting, we showed them where shelters were located. We showed them where clients came from and where we needed to have shelter. And we made it very clear that as part of this new approach to shelter, it wasn't going to be haphazard anymore. We were going to cite shelters where it would meet a client need. And since that time, the providers have been out there bringing proposals to us. Proposals to us may not make it through the process for a number of different reasons. One issue is that they lose site control. Uh, there are a number of sites that we thought would have worked out, but they're, you know, we're all living in the world of real estate in New York City, and the provider loses the site to somebody else. So that is a, a common uh, uh, issue. The other is it's not open. It's not going to be open in, in a time frame that makes any sense to us because uh, of the immediate need. We, you know, we forget sometimes in these uh, principal conversations that at the end of the day we've got an obligation to shelter people that come to us every night even as we're trying to turn around the system we still got to provide shelter every night which is how we're using commercial hotels as a bridge as we get out of clusters and bring the new shelters on but I think typically the shelter is being proposed to us through an open-ended RFP process sealed bid buy a not-for-profit and we're evaluating it for does it meet the the terms of the of the RFP is it consistent with the turn of the tide principles uh, and in, sometimes in that process they're losing site control or sometimes in that process it's going to take too long uh, we've had other instances where uh, you know, people come to us with sites elected officials and we're sending them back, hey, there are providers, uh, and I think we've had a great ex several examples of those. I don't want to mean to put Council Member Torres on the spot where there have been providers that are really important locally. Uh, and same thing with Council Member Salamanca who have, have come to us ultimately by being connected to a site in that area. And that makes a lot of sense for clients and I think it makes a lot of sense for the communities. So we welcome that type of iterative process. But as that is going on, we have an obligation to provide shelter every night. We have an obligation to get out of clusters, and we have an obligation to get ourselves out of, out of hotels. Just to ask a follow-up, and I'm sorry to use more of my time. Um, can you talk about the one the question that comes, I get this question all the time, is the decision to purchase at a certain amount, ver I mean, sorry, lease at a certain amount from a owner uh, versus buying the building at cost. And I understand the way you can do that is different, but just to, to just, because I get that question often about why not not just take custody of and make it housing that could still be available to, to, to folks as well. And the second question I have is if, I could say it's for my district, for I, I think for sure, if, if sites are available and are not being competed for in, in Midtown Manhattan, that raises the question, I think, of their desirable spots. And so that raises a concern we talk about conditions and safety. If they are not being purchased by somebody in a very speculative market in Midtown Manhattan about what, what that represents to uh, the condition of the building or the, you know, the size or what, whatever else it might be. And I was wondering if you could 
not to put you on the spot in, in, a, in a bad way, but I, I, I would be curious to hear what the response is. Uh, no, I appreciate the opportunity to respond. You must be talking about 58th Street uh, to, to pick a, a, a site. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> may, may perhaps, yeah. May yeah. perhaps. Um, and, and again, I think I, I appreciate what you were recognized by the New York Times for doing in that situation. But um, at 58th Street, I can assure you that, look, we're, our, our, our values, we're not going to put uh, employed homeless men uh, in a building that's not safe to be in. Uh, this building was inspected by the fire department, inspected by the Department of Buildings. Ultimately, they're the regulators, uh, and they're, uh, you know, this building was audited uh, by the, the Department of Buildings, was audited, uh, audited the building multiple times. There's a lot of oversight that got us to the position where this is a building that's gonna be appropriate to use for, uh, uh, for employed single men in that area because ultimately uh, uh, we want it to be safe, but then it's not our decision only, it's the, regulate, the, the um, enforcement agencies that play a role here. And uh, you know, that's a building that was safe to be occupied before it was a shelter, and it's gonna be even safer to occupy once it's a shelter because we've put in a number of upgrades uh, to make it an even uh, a better place than it was before it was, before it's gonna be a shelter. Obviously there's litigation, uh, we've been very successful across the city with litigation, and we will uh, obviously be hopeful that outcome uh, will will um, uh, uh, will, will be favorable as well at that location. In terms of purchasing, I mean, there are, there are not for profits that have been very entre entrepreneurial. BRC is a good example in Councilmember Cabrera's district. Uh, they've got a, a shelter that combines permanent housing on one side of the lot and, and shelter on the other side. Uh, and it's a terrific place, again, for, for, uh, for employed men, homeless men uh, who are being sheltered there, and they, and they bought the property. And there are other not-for-profits that are doing the same. I know Wynn has done that as well. And that's a model that we're very supportive of, and we're going to keep working with the not-for-profits uh, to, to help support them in those initiatives, because we think, uh, as is implicit in your question, that that's a very viable way to proceed here. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. Uh, Councilmember Richie Torres. Commissioner, always great to see you. Um, Good to see you too. Running both DHS and HRA is a Herculean challenge, so you have my respect Thank you. and gratitude. I have a few questions on a number of topics. What's the trajectory of opioid overdoses in the shelter system? Uh, I want to say the last report we reported on is about a 175, I want to be careful because I'm under oath, but I, in that neighborhood, those were the number, I think, of, of, uh, of, of naloxone administrations that we reported on, I believe, in the last report to the council. If I've got the number slightly wrong, it's in the report. I, I don't know at all. Is it trending up, down? Is it stagnant? I, I mean, I think we'll, we'll have our, our re full report out next month on uh, fatalities. Okay. Uh, the health department report. Um, I would expect that this will continue to be a challenge, okay. as it is across the country, uh, uh, and also across the country in, in uh, uh, among people who are homeless, uh, who are in, in the streets and, and, and in shelter. I think uh, your legislation, and I've said this a number of different times, I think was helpful in terms of focusing us on the importance of training both clients. Uh, as well as our staff, and every save is a save that that you you helped us do, and I really appreciate that. Does fentanyl remain the driver of these overdoses? Yeah, or? yeah, continues to be a big driver. Um, I don't have the article in front of me, but a few months ago there was an article about the abuse of shelter residents at the hands of some of these private security firms. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering if if DHS conducted its own investigation, were the results of that investigation, and whether there's been enhanced oversight or background checks on, on those private security firms? Uh, there, there are some enhanced steps we're, we're taking for oversight uh, that I'll probably talk about in my, um, I guess by the next time I'll probably see is my preliminary budget hearing. Okay. But I think that you are- Does that include background checks or? Um, I want to be careful how I answer it, but it, it, I think it'll address uh, concerns that you had raised to me about the private security companies. Yeah. Uh, but we should certainly talk offline before then to make sure I'm, I'm on the right track for where you want to go. And also, I guess, what are your thoughts on the, when I saw the data about the, the distribution of contracts among private security firms, it seems like there were two players in the industry that had a disproportionate share of the contracts. There was something of a duopoly. What are your thoughts on that? Just the concentration of contracts in so few firms? 
Yeah, I mean, I think this is a challenge in terms of the procurement process uh, and who and what the market is. Um, I, uh, but I, I, I re you asked me this question at a, at a previous hearing, and, and my thoughts, I think, are still the same, which is there's a procurement process, but there's clearly a concern there as well. I've come across articles indicating that there are shelters with, with one means of egress. Um, on the surface, that would seem to be a, a clear fire hazard. So, I mean, how do we, how do we ensure the safety of residents in shelters that only have a single means of egress? Again, you must be talking about 58th Street. I know Council Member uh, Powers uh, left. Um, again, this is a building that's been thoroughly inspected by the Department of Buildings and the Fire Department. Uh, we upgraded a number of the systems there to meet what the Fire Department and the Department of Buildings said we should do. We can't open it without their approval. Um, I can assure you, I mean, I don't know if this is reassuring or not. You, you, you know me. I'm not going to put people in a building where they're going to be at risk. Uh, and you know, I think the other reality is that there are. Is that the norm in your shelters, or do your no. shelters typically have more than one means of egress? Typically, more than one means of egress. But I also want to say there are thousands of buildings in New York City that have only one means of egress. This particular building on 50th Street is going to be. Um, is going to meet all, any safety requirement that the fire department uh, the, and the department of buildings told us we should put in place uh, to open it. Setting aside 58th Street, which yep. is a I think politically charged uh, case, would you oppose if if there were a local law, if there were a proposed local law mandating that every shelter have a, more than one means of egress? Is that a policy that you would oppose or support or? I'd be concerned that it would be used in the way that it's being used in 58th Street to block us from opening a shelter for uh, homeless uh, uh, employed men who need that facility. Uh, before we opened it, uh, proposed to open it as a shelter, it had only one means of egress and it was used uh, totally in compliant with the law as a uh, but, but, but I guess that would be unfair because there are, there are legitimate policy purposes that could always be perverted as a pretext. That, that's a concern. You know, and, and, that's the concern and like concerned. you, I have no use for nimbyistic uh, opposition to shelter sightings, and I think I've shown that. You, you have more than shown that uh, in your approach. So I'm just raising an issue in, in response to your question yeah. about a concern uh, uh, about going that direction. I guess I'll squeeze in a few more. Um, speaking of turning, the, uh, have we turned the tide in favor of fair share, right? There were a number of community districts and council districts that have no shelters at all. Have we increased the number of community and council districts that? We're, we are uh, making progress and we have more to be done. So what's that progress specifically? Um, you know, we've got shelters cited in parts of, uh, you know, we've got shelters cited in the Riverdale uh, Community Board where there never had been a shelter. But you told me that last time, has that been? We have shelters that are cited to open in Queens now in certain communities that have never had shelters before. Uh, uh, and we're gonna continue that. Let me give you a fuller accounting and I also think when we get to the two-year anniversary of Turn of the Tide, which is February 28th, um, I'll, I'll look forward to having a conversation with you about the roadmap of how it, how it now looks compared to how it looked last year. Because you, um, you made some very important, uh, good points. Do you keep track of the number of people who have been transitioned from shelter to permanent housing? Or? Uh, we do. I should have answered you. I can answer your question somewhat more uh, fully. College Point, Queens, Ditmas Park, Brooklyn, Ozone Park, uh, Queens are areas that there had not been shelters previously, and those are communities that there have been additional sightings in, and there'll be more coming. Okay, right. Do you keep track of the number of people who have been transitioned from shelter we to do. permanent housing? What, what's that number? Uh, 101,000 people have gotten our rental assistance or rehousing. Almost all of those are moving out of shelter. There's some roughly 10,000 or so uh, that are prevention-oriented uh, interventions we had to avoid people coming in. But as I said earlier in the testimony, it's a, it's a, that type of rental assistance and rehousing tool is something that no commissioner had before me. And we're gonna continue to move forward with even more people relocated. The return rate of people who are returning to shelter is very low, it's in the MMR, uh, from the people that are being getting uh, the subsidized housing that we're providing. I guess how are we, because that seems like a high number, but when one considers the ubiquity of source of income discrimination, the scarcity of deeply affordable housing, I imagine the people you are transitioning to permanently affordable housing have some of the lowest median incomes in the city, 
How are you able to overcome those barriers? Uh, I mean, we're subsidizing the gap between rents and income. Uh, that doesn't mean there aren't still barriers. I mean, in my beginning of the testimony, I said that there, you know, rents went up almost 19 percent and incomes up less than 5 percent over this last period of time, and we lost 150,000 rent regulated apartments. We're operating in that environment, and I appreciate the question, which I took a little bit as a compliment, uh, that we've been able to get a lot of people connected to housing through the different tools we've got. We wanted to connect even more people to housing with the tools we've been, we've been given. My time has expired. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much, uh, Councilor Torres. Councilor Adrian Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Mr. Banks. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll just do a sidebar uh, before I begin uh, my questions. I just wanted to, wanted to say that had it not uh, been for the viral video uh, that was taken by another HRA client. I dare say that we would have no knowledge. I don't believe that your staff would have informed you of the magnitude of the situation. And um, I will also say that we do appreciate the fact that you have taken swift action uh, when it pertains to that situation. Um, Thank you. It's still utterly heartbreaking. It horrible. never should happen again. Horrible. Okay. Uh, all roads for me lead to Southeast Queens, as you know. Uh, we feel like the Bronx. Thank you very much, Councilmember Salamanca, for your bills, actually. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Torres just addressed uh, some issues of fair share, which is where I was going as well. We've seen some movement and uh, in, in the equity needle being moved a little bit. Um, lately, you just referenced College Park and Ozone Park. I, I just want to know, and if you don't have it, your staff can get back to me later. The current number of hotels being used to shelter the homeless in Southeast Queens Community Boards 10, 12, and 13, do we have a number? Uh, let me get you that number, but I know when, when we met together two summers ago, I yep. think it was, two summers ago, uh, that we talked about how to avoid uh, continued usage in the particular uh, district we're in, mm -hmm. and I think you would agree we've kept that uh, commitment because what I had said at the time, even before we had turned the tide, is that there are about twice as many people housed in the district as needed to be connected to the district. And we'll get you further information, but I just, for the record, wanted to acknowledge what I thought was a very good conversation. I think even before you were in your current position, right. you were very much focused right. on this issue, and I, and I appreciated the partnership on that. Thank you, thank you. Um, I would really like to know those current yep. numbers. We'll give you current them. numbers. Thank you, all right. Um, again, and as it pertains to uh, community boards 10, 12, and 13, do we know how many hotels came online this year in 2018? I, again, for those specific areas, I want to I want right. to get you that information. Uh, but it, it very much focused on the conversation we had two years ago. I we've we've really been very consistent with what we had committed to do in that area. Mm -hmm. We have seen some movement as far as move outs. Um, and I think I'd, I mentioned, I don't know if I mentioned in the past that I know at least one of my constituents wanted to stay where she was and came to us for help and we told her, no, we re really, really need to see this move out happen and why. So we have seen that happen Thank as you. well. So Thank you. I want to note that. Um, in building my relationships with my principals in my district, uh, we have a very large number, needless to say, of children who are homeless um, uh, living in shelters. And uh, I, I'd just like to know, are there new initiatives that you're looking at um, for children in shelter to provide additional educational and mental support? I mean, I think the most important initiative we have for children in shelter is the, um, is the Thrive Initiative to add social workers in a 1 to 25 ratio to really deal with the trauma that children have gone through from losing their home. I mean, if we think of ourselves as children, our own children, the experience of having stability and losing a roof over your head has an impact on, on children. And that's why uh, that the Thrive Initiative is so important to us. Um, I think a second initiative that's very important to us is, and I think it was covered in the Daily News uh, and, and elsewhere, we implemented something called a School Proximity Project, which is to try to right size uh, where people are placed to connect them to as close as possible to the uh, to schools. We are now have 75.5 percent of our families with children uh, who don't have domestic violence safety concerns. 75.5 percent of those families are housed in the borough of the youngest child school, uh, and we're going to keep driving that number up as we site and open more of the turn of the tide shelters. 
but I, again, it seems to me that the, the support through the social workers and educational stability are two of the most critical things that we can do for children. And this will be my last uh, question, I think. It, it, bless you. The uh, instances around nutrition and um, concerns around nutrition and programs around nutrition, does, your organiz uh, d does the agency pay specific attention to nutrition as it pertains to uh, children in shelter? Um, by the way, just for the record, there are, we'll, we'll get you the exact number, but there are approximately 25 commercial hotels in that Southeast Queens area. Um, I'm gonna answer your question, but I wanted to make a larger point. I, I think I've said this when, when we were at the borough board, uh, maybe earlier in the year, or about a year ago maybe it was, that one of the issues is once we take down all the hotels in Queens, there'll be a gap of a couple of thousand beds uh, that we'll need to replace with, with shelters because, again, we're trying to right-size the shelter system to have need from a borough be aligned with uh, the ability to offer the opportunity to be sheltered in a borough. And so Queens uh, had the, you know 50% uh, plus of the hotel commercial hotels. The Bronx had 70% of the clusters. So one of the issues we're going to have in Southeast Queens and all over the borough is we right-size as we close uh, commercial hotels, we may have to provide other opportunities for people to be sheltered in a, in a better way. Uh, but we'll give you more granular information. That's sort of a top line in terms of that number of commercial hotels. Um, back to nutrition. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I think that turning the tide shelters are so important, uh, because they're going to provide us with the ability to have cooking facilities for families to be able to um, uh, regain stability as much as possible in a family-type setting as opposed to uh, the way in which the shelter system has developed over, over a period of time where that wasn't uh, an important value. Okay, thank you. My final question is going to be, and you, I think you, you probably hit on it a little bit just now. Uh, my focus is still on equity in the borough, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, there are several buildings going up in my district and neighboring district, um, a lot surrounding affordable housing, but some questionable as of right buildings are being built as we speak and are almost uh, fully built. Um, I would like to have a commitment from DHS that these will not be homeless shelters, that they will be affordable housing if possible. I know that I'm asking a lot and that's probably not even in your purview, but I would like to put that on your radar uh, to make it clear that in the interest of equity in Southeast Queens pertaining to sheltering and move outs of hotels, that the properties, the buildings that are going up uh, in Southeast Queens, particularly District 28, um, not, be, not be used, not be contracted by DHS or with DHS for further sheltering purposes. So I don't know which sites you're referring to. Let's have a conversation about it. But I also want to level set too that as we close every one of those 25 hotels, and as I think I, I've said at other hearings and, and I said at this hearing, there's a mismatch between the numbers of people housed uh, in your uh, part of the borough and the numbers of people in the borough who need to be housed in that area. Uh, <coughs> and it, obviously it's not one-to-one, -one, but there's a mismatch. And uh, we're gonna need to do some replacement so I don't know if any of those buildings, how any of those buildings relate to it that you re reference, but why don't we sit down and have a conversation and see what they are and, and talk through what the options are, frankly. I'd like that. Uh, again, this is in the interest <laughs> of fair share, and we all know that when it comes to Southeast Queens, fair share takes a holiday. Thanks very much. We're, we're working hard to put uh, fair share uh, back to work. Thank you, Councilmember Adams. Uh, Councilmember Mark Traeger. Thank you, Chair, for holding this very important hearing. Welcome, Commissioner. Um, I have, uh, I'll begin with a, a, a local question and begin to uh, more of a DOE citywide uh, question. Um, I'm, I'm actually very proud of how uh, uh, Coney Island, my residents, have responded to the uh, proposed wind shelter um, on Neptune Avenue. I think we've had very substantive and thoughtful discussions around mm -hmm. it. Um, and I do want to, you know, thank your office and also Christine Quinn and Wynn for being very responsive throughout the process. I do have one follow-up question that really has not been yet kind of resolved with regards to um, the site itself, uh, its history. Um, uh, I know that uh, Wynn had conducted some sort of a site history 
investigation about, it used to be an old dye factory. Um, it was also used as a, it was a, um, a health clinic by Coney Island Hospital that was damaged by Superstorm Sandy. The hospital system said it was not safe to rebuild there. So residents you know, raised just valid questions for the safety of the folks who are, will be coming in. Um, are you familiar with the site history? Are you confident in its safety that it will provide, uh, it will be a safe structure and, and there's nothing, no contaminants that will harm the people there? I, I am confident. I know, uh, you know neither Chris Quinn or Wynn nor, nor we would want to proceed with something where there's a real a real risk. And, uh, and again, I want to acknowledge your comment at the outset that it, I think it has been a, uh, it's never an easy process, but I appreciate your, your um, highlighting the, the sort of positive forward uh, progress that we're making to get to a place where uh, people can understand that it's going to open, it's going to be a good thing for the clients, and ultimately will be a good, a good thing for the district to give uh, children from that area of Brooklyn uh, the opportunity to be housed there. So again, I appreciate your your help in what I know has been a difficult process. Just, I, I would just appreciate if uh, your office can just um, um, try to get back to the local community board just about the, this height, this height history, um, just to make sure that you know it's safe for the families there, and uh, that's that that's really our, our main concern. Um, I have some uh, DOE related questions with regards to uh, coordination and communication with D, uh, DHS. Uh, with, uh, with regards to um, uh, students requesting a transfer uh, to a, a, a shelter closer to their school, what is the process for requesting a transfer to a shelter closer to a child's school? Um, I'm going to answer that. I just wanted to give you a little bit more detail that uh, um, Deputy Commissioner Bray gave me because she's got a lot of good information. Um, so we've completed phases one and two of the uh, EAS. Uh, and all have determined to be safe, and, and we, I believe we either shared or will be sharing the documents with the community. I think we have shared them, but we'll make sure that you, that you can see them as well. Um, <clears throat> the process for re requesting a transfer is actually active from us, and that's what I referenced earlier, the school proximity project. As we transform the shelter system, we're creating some capacity ability to move people around that didn't exist previously, and so over the summer we identified uh, families with children who were going to be commuting a long distance to get to school, uh, and we very much offered each of them an opportunity to move uh, to the borough where the youngest child was in school. I think some of these were highlighted in, in, in the Daily News series on, on children in, in shelter and children who were unstably housed uh, but not in shelter. And so we've been, we've been ourselves identifying uh, families that we think are commuting for too far a distance, and so we did the proximity project in the summer leading up to the opening of school. We're going to be we're going to continue that during the school year to try to move as many families as possible to be as close to the school that they want to be. Um, families can request them. <clears throat> it had been difficult in the past to grant them, but we had a very good track record of what we just did over the summer before the start of school, and we're going to be doing it again. I think it's also important to see the number we're at now, point in time. So 75.5% of the families with children who don't have DV safety concerns are now in the borough of their youngest child's school. We've still got, obviously, you know, 25% to go, but you can see, I think, with building better capacity and better sightings closer to, uh, in communities where we maybe never have had sightings before, I think we can meet what your concern and my concern is, which is not disrupting kids' education. Right, but how does DHS let the families know about the process and know about their rights with regards, because you, you mentioned that the families could request it. Sometimes they're not aware of, of these particular rights and, and uh, that's available to them. Understood, I mean, the family has the right to either keep the child in their existing school and get transportation to go, or to re-register their, their child in, in a new school. As part of the school proximity project, we've been reaching out to the families individually at, on a proactive basis, asking them if they want to move. And how many approved transfers have we had so far this school year? Uh, I have to get back to you that number because it's gone up since the time we did the proximity project over the summer. So yeah. I'll get back to that. I, I would appreciate that. And, and just in closing, I recently had a uh, discussion with uh, Chris Caruso. Uh, is that a number you have? 
inputs. Okay. Uh, I recently had a discussion with the DOE with regards to. I just uh, the, I apologize, Council Member. Yeah. The note was not a number. It was just making sure that I reiterate the following point: that any time a new family uh, 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 with children's site opens. We offer all families with children the chance to uh, transfer there who live in that community board. So there's sort of two iterations going on. One is our overall school proximity project of trying to link people to existing sites, but anytime a new site opens, uh, we, we want to offer children. Like, for example, the one we opened in Crown Heights about a year ago uh, was the first families with children shelter of that nature in that area, and we offered people the opportunity to move there. Just recently had a shelter that opened Rockaway, same thing, g giving the opportunity to families to move there. So I apologize, I cut you off. Sure, uh, and, but I would like for you guys to get back to me. You, on, on numbers, number. we will. Um, just, I, I recently met with Chris Caruso uh, from the DOE yep. where they are transferring the support for students in temporary housing over to his office. Yep. Uh, in community schools. I remain concerned, I'm sharing this with you as I shared with him, um, about our capacity to uh, appropriately and adequately respond to the needs of our most, most vulnerable families. And uh, I'll explain by saying that when I mentioned to you, I asked you before about how does DHS let students know about, and actually and I, I'm gonna also join by Chair Levin who, who is excellent at that briefing, um, but whether or not we know if we're asking the right questions, if we're informing folks of, of their rights. Um, I am a big believer in licensed social workers. I think guidance counselors should be placed and working in the shelter uh, as well to assist these families. Um, these are very um, sensitive, delicate, technical cases. Um, and at times, historically, we've seen that the personnel that we put in front of these families, um, again, I, and I, applaud every person that works for the city of New York, but you, you know, there's an expression, uh, there are things you don't know that you don't know and you don't even know it yet. And I just wanna make sure that we are putting people who are licensed and credentialed in front of the most vulnerable families. The initial point of contact is so critical to let them know about their rights, uh, what, how to navigate bureaucracy, how to fight bureaucracy. And um, I am not sensing or hearing that we are uh, placing licensed social workers or guidance counselors in these, uh, whether it's a shelter or, or more of our schools, to better respond to their needs. So I'd like for you, to, for you to respond to that, and I thank the chair for his time. Okay, I, I take your point, and I also like your old, old expression, uh, which I think is uh, very important to always keep in mind. Um, I know the chancellor is very focused on this. Uh, he and I have spoken about it uh, a number of times. Uh, we have a joint um, sort of DOE uh, DHS and HRA working um, um, a group, and we're very focused on how to make improvements. I think we're all cognizant of, of some of the historical challenges here, but I think there's a real commitment between the DOE and our agency to, um, to make some significant progress. We couldn't have done the proximity project without their help. Uh, ultimately, some of you know, their staff can be uh, even more persuasive than our staff sometimes, and so it was a real collaborative with the DOE uh, to make this happen. Thank you, Councilmember Trigger. Uh, Councilmember Salamanca for a second round. Councilmember, in the interest of time, I'll forego my questions. Yeah, and I'll, I'll meet with the commissioner on the side. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Salamanca. Um, commissioner, I just have a couple last questions uh, just uh, on the topic of transfers. We didn't touch on that too much today. You mentioned in your testimony um, uh, that you have submitted or crafted a, a, a transfer plan um, um, and submitted to OTDA. Can you explain a little bit just what the process is, why OTDA has to sign off on your transfer plan? Yeah, I, that wasn't quite what I said, but I can understand why, why you might, might have thought that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the operative rule is 48 hours notice uh, for a non-emergency transfer. Uh, at the 90 day, during the 90 day review, I met with uh, Picture of the Homeless, I met with other groups that talk, I met with the Coalition of the Homeless, uh, Vocal, other groups, and the safety net activists to talk to me about some of the challenges and some of the things that they wanted to know more about, uh, you know, emergency transfers versus administrative transfers. And so we, so we set about making uh, some changes in our approach, but subsequently, we don't we don't need approval for making those changes, but subsequently we've now learned that the state is going to, as part of a larger shelter regulation changes, cover transfers. 
and we want to make sure that what we're what they're re we're gonna, we're going to do is going to be consistent with their regulation and depending on what their regulation says there may be some issues about what the two pieces of legislation say so i haven't seen the regulations uh, from the state they have not been issued yet uh, and when we see them we want to compare them to what we were planning to do and plan compare them to what your uh, what you would like to legislate and then uh, sit down and work with you about any issues that may arise because of that. Okay. Um, how many transfers occur um, quarterly or monthly, however you want to break it down? I, I was afraid you were going to ask me that question. It's probably the one question I didn't prepare for, but I will get, get you that information. Okay. And we, we would like that kind of broken down by um, the type of, uh, whether it's a single adult, uh, adult family, or family with children. Yeah, we'll, we'll get you that information. Okay. Um, and then do we have a breakdown of how many transfers, percentage-wise, how many transfers are administrative versus uh, emergency? Uh, and just to be clear, what's the, what's the definition of those two things, and emergency versus administrative? I mean, we'll- Or administrative we'll, emergency? We'll, we'll get you that, but by way of example, if you know, we have to close a shelter uh, because of safety reasons, so like, I don't know, National Grid, for example, tells us that there's a problem with the gas. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an example okay. of that that Fair was enough. publicized. That right. another, another instance, we had space in families with children shelters, and we need to close a hotel that was for families with children to make it available for single men in the middle of the winter. I mean, there, those are examples, health and safety-related mm -hmm. issues. Okay. Uh, obviously, we've heard complaints. There's been articles written about people that feel as if um, uh, transfers have been used as a form of retaliation. They've complained about conditions. They've complained about treatment. Um, they've complained about, um, uh, you know, just uh, various aspects of, of uh, their, their shelter facility or programming, um, and, and then they were um, moved or they received a transfer. Um, can you say um, unequivocally that that never happens? Uh, it certainly should not happen, but I can say, as I said before, I, I did focus groups with um, people from Picture the Homeless, people mm -hmm. from Coalition of the Homeless, people from Safety and Act Activists and Vocal, who gave me examples of things that were of concern to me and other leadership at the agency, and that's why we were going to make some changes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think uh, there shouldn't be retaliation for request. Um, I think how we were going to approach this would have addressed concerns that clients had. Let's see what the state regulation says and, and take it from there. I think the other issue that I just want to make sure we all have out in front of us, <coughs> this is a complicated situation in which somebody says, X is a problem in my room and X is actually a safety issue. For the resident, it's going to feel like they're being transferred if there's no other place uh, in, in retaliation, right. if there's no other place they could stay in in that, in that building. But uh, we're, our approach was to avoid any second guessing of what the situations were and to be able to have a, a transparent transfer policy so people understand what's happening. We'll see, again, we'll see what the state regulation says and see what we can do with what we're intending to do. I mean, that's what our with you too legislation gets at is making sure that there's a very clear, transparent, written record as to why a transfer happens. As of now, I don't believe that there, people are given a very... No, there, are, there is notification that's provided, but obviously that we would, felt... That's that what the cause is and, and in a clear uh, way. So because I think what we're hearing now is it's hard to appeal it because there's nothing in there in the administrative transfer um, that specifies why you've been transferred. And so if you want to appeal it, it's hard to say that, it w that the agency was in the wrong if you don't know why, why the agency is saying they did it. Uh, understood, but some of these are, for example, uh, and again- They I, could I, be, I, yeah, yeah, they could be for good cause. It's just we don't know. Right, but I think, for, for example, I heard a lot of things in the focus groups I did with clients to, that raised concerns with me, so therefore I'm not, I'm not disputing uh, your, the, the substance of your question, which is, is are, are there mistakes that are made? Um, some transfers that occur, for example, are, you know, when we're closing some of the cluster units. I know there are disputes about that. I get that there are other problems apart from that kind of thing, and that's why we wanted to make some reforms, if there's a, and that's why you want to legislate. Right. And we're trying there's a to good reason why a transfer is happening. Um, People everyone should know ought to know about it. People should know. Um, I agree with that. And is there a process to appeal it? Uh, there is a process to appeal it. I can tell you, however, as... 
that goes to ECB or that's uh, at, at HRA uh, or at DHS? You, you could request a fair hearing, but I can tell you that I litigated and lost in the second department the question of whether or not you get a pre-transfer hearing or a post-transfer hearing. The, sorry, I'm sorry, so it's, it's, sorry, it's at oath, is it oath? No, oath? it's a state administrative hearing. Okay. But it's a post-transfer hearing uh, uh, because of the, frankly, the ruling in that case. So there's no injunctive <coughs> relief or anything? That as I said, the, yeah. the process is defined by a, 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 a court case. Yep. Um, but let's, again, I, I don't know what the state regulations are going to say. When are we expecting and, those state regulations? Uh, I thought this month, but as it turns out, it's going to be next month. Okay. Um, so we should sit down and talk about that. Uh, Councilman Raspinall couldn't be here today, but uh, obviously he's interested in the matter. Yep. Happy to do that with both of you. Um, okay. Um, and then uh, I do want to ask about, in your testimony, you spoke about um, uh, capital needs a little bit. I just do want to ask you about um, about that, if you just give me one second here. Um, what, what is the average span of time to complete capital, large capital projects? These are in tier twos, for example, that, that could be the source of long-term violations. Um, average span of time, um, or a minimum and maximum time. Um, is there a preference for, for urgent needs like roof repairs or plumbing, things that are, um, you know, directly impacting clients' daily experience? Yes, I mean, I can give you sort of a top line of it. So, for example, there's 130 uh, renovation projects. Uh, as I said, there are 61 that are in design, 24 in construction, 45 uh, that are in the planning stage. Uh, this is pretty expedited for these, this kind of capital project development. Um, you know, of those, for example, of the 24 that are in construction, you know, eight of them are already 76 to 100% done uh, that are being managed by, um, uh, by, by uh, our agency and uh, uh, a DDC. So we're moving pretty rapidly. We've got a pretty focused tracking system on getting this done. And the kinds of problems that you're focusing on are obviously the priority ones for us yeah. uh, to address uh, whatever uh, sort of an emergent matter. On the other hand, you know, you take the Bellevue building that's got a facade problem that's been there for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're working to fix it and meanwhile addressing uh, inside the building to make sure the facade problem isn't causing any challenges in the building. Okay. Um, and then lastly, going from capital needs to human needs, um, it, we've heard from advocates uh, in advance of this hearing that in a, shelter conditions need to also include things like social workers, uh, housing specialists that are able to effectively do their job uh, under the new requirements under city FAPS. Um, you know, across the board training for staff, including trauma-informed care and de-escalation, obviously, which is apropos, expanded opioid treatment in shelters with community providers. Um, so those are all things that, as we're talking about conditions in shelters, um, we need to also be thinking of, of that as well. And I know you do, but uh, I, I, um, we want to make sure that we keep a, um, you know, a, a pretty vigilant eye on these things. Well, again, I think that's a good question to ask. It's, it's the reason why, you know, we've invested about a quarter of a billion dollars in the not-for-profits because of all those years of disinvestment. But it's not just disinvestment on the physical repairs. That investment includes uh, mm -hmm. the kinds of things that you're talking about in terms of, uh, you know, staffing and, and, and so forth. So I think we're, we're on, the, you and I are on the same wavelength uh, about the importance of both physical infrastructure and, and human uh, human needs. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner, very much for your time. I Thank appreciate you it. For, Thank you. Uh, for your time as well and for the work that both you and the committee and Council Member Salamanca in particular are doing. Great. Thank you. So we have uh, 23 people that have signed up to testify, so we'll keep a clock uh, going for three minutes. Uh, first panel, Jose Castillo, Laura Mashu. 
Catherine Chapani, uh, and Giselle Routier, and Beth Hoffmeister. Okay, whoever wants to begin. Good afternoon. My name is Jose uh, Castillo, Jr. I'm speaking today for Angela Castillo. She couldn't be here today. She if you can get a little closer to the microphone, that'd be great, thanks. I'm here today to speak on behalf of Angela Castillo. She was a subject of a New York Times report on May 10, 2017, which highlighted what she believed to be retaliation against her for making several complaints about the issues that she had at her shelter. Um, there are two specific issues that occurred. One that originally happened um, around a year earlier where she just asked to have some repairs done, like electrical outlet and a toilet really was two of the main concerns she had. In response to that, she received an email from DHS directly which said, we have processed a transfer for you. Immediately she responded, as the article highlighted, where she said, no, I don't want to transfer, I just want to have some issues resolved. What's the appeal process? After that, or that, that was on a weekend actually, uh, on Monday, she was notified around that time that she would be transferred. There was no appeal process or rights given to her or any notice provided before any of this. She called me I, and I said, look, I don't know what to do. We reached out to Espinel's office. He was instrumental in helping um, calm us down a little bit, figuring out what options there were. We realized there really wasn't any one to give us any answers. So that, that week she uh, moved before the Supreme Court in Kings County for a temporary restraining order, which the judge granted, stopping the transfer, allowing them to kind of bring a discussion to the table. After that, she was able to stay. There was a settlement that was agreed where she can stay instead of being transferred. Again, there are, other, there are four children involved as well. We're talking about 10-year-old, two, two, two five-year-olds at the time, and um, now she has a, a, a little 18-month-old. So it, it would immediately displace the family. They didn't know where she was going. So luckily the judge issued the temporary restraining order, the settlement occurred, and then everything seemed to be fine. A couple of months later, I think, uh, the commissioner actually mentioned the, the, the national grid issue. That was the second issue. She was told that she would be temporarily moved because of a national grid issue. She was temp told it was temporary. Everything was documented as temporary. But when she got to the facility at Canva, they said, oh, no, this is a permanent transfer. You're not going back. And that completely threw her off. And so what she did was she re-brought the action based on the stipulation, which says she's supposed to stay there because it was supposed to be tra a temporary transfer. Long story short, that also settled, she went back. Unfortunately, it's almost as if you have to go to court and navigate this entire system that it's not really friendly for a family, a single mother with four children, that, was, that put a lot of pressure on her. So that's, I'm here to share her story. Um, and, sorry if you, if you don't mind me asking. Um, her, um, well, how is she doing now? She's doing okay, but she's, it's funny you say that because December 7th, this last Friday, 
She um, was caught off guard. And this also ties into the other part of legislation, which talks about the customer service training, where it seems like from a top down, we reached out to high levels of DHS individuals. None of them responded. And the response or the response that you get is was completely it was it was it was overkill. It was really, really, in a, in a sense, uh, taken aback to, to some of the language that was used. And mm -hmm. of course, all that she, she can provide. But I think today um, on December, she was threatened with another transfer because I guess that's the way you, you resolve issues is when you have a concern, you're literally, and she sent an email on Friday, December 7th, um, thank you for asking that question, mm -hmm. which asked the people, hey, I want a DHS conference now because I don't want to be threatened again with another transfer. In response, they ignored that and they set up a, an internal conference. And so I guess she's gonna deal with that and she's gonna hope that she can move out. Right now she's working to try to get a voucher. Um, she's been trying to do that for a long time. How, if you don't mind me asking, how long has she been? Since 2014, I believe, 2014, 2015. So it's been a while. And she should, I mean, she's supposed to be getting a voucher after 90 days. Well, she would, at one point she was working and fortunately there was so many turnover with the housing specialists and with the facility, I think, if I'm not mistaken, this was a Bedco uh, run facility. Now it's run by another facility uh, mm -hmm. company. So there was a lot of turnover. And, and every time someone new comes in, it's like no one knows what to do. No one, they're, all, they're getting up to speed. So she's been in shelter for th three or four years? Yes, three? yes. With no, with no voucher? With no voucher. At one point she was working right now, she was told that she may qualify for a FEPS. So they're trying to see if that is a possibility, a FEPS voucher, which is one where, um, based on her circumstances, she may qualify for it. Hopefully she does. And we'll see what happens with that. Um, so please convey to her that she's inspired legislation that's been put forward today. We appreciate um, you testifying on her behalf. Um, and she is bringing her story to light on behalf of many others uh, whose this has happened to, whose story is, you know, has not come to public attention, um, but she's doing this on behalf of a lot of other people. And you have my commitment that I'm I'll, happy to work with, with you or her on ensuring that her, um, I mean, to me it's inexcusable that she is, does not have a, um, a voucher yet or a, 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 a path forward um, into permanent housing um, after three or four years, four years, um, um, and that's the responsibility of the city, of DHS, HRA, and the social services agencies um, to make sure that she's on that path. And so um, to me it's, it's um, uh, very frustrating to hear this. And uh, please convey our regards to her. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Giselle Ruth here. I'm the policy director of the Coalition for the Homeless. We've submitted joint testimony with legal aid, but I'll get it started. Um, I do wanna top this off by mentioning that we hit a new record for the number of people sleeping in shelters as of October. Um, particularly disturbing among single adults, we've now surpassed 17,000 single adults sleeping in shelters each night as of August, uh, and shows no sign of abating at this point. Um, and over the past three months, the number of homeless single adults has reached a new record high 21 times. So within this context, we appreciate this hearing um, looking at a comprehensive examination into shelter conditions and upkeep. As the court appointed independent monitors of the single adult shelter system and the city appointed independent monitors of the family shelter system, we gather a steady stream of information about shelter conditions through in-person visits, joint inspections, and resident complaints. The most common issues we encounter fall into a few broad categories, and I'm gonna talk about a few of them now. Uh, the first one is large-scale capital needs, so I wanna thank you for, for bringing that up with the commissioner. Um, many capital needs that we've seen have been in the pipeline for years and years and are still not completed. Um, not all of the specifics are clear in the line item breakdowns in the OMB capital commitment plan, um, but we are aware of a few capital needs that are, are extremely urgent and that we see in our, the daily work that we do. Um, a lot of these rear, are um, with respect to leafs, leaks, roof, particularly with roofs and plumbing, HVAC, HVAC issues, particularly with cooling and ventilation in the summer and heating in the winter, um, as well as elevator breakdowns, and we think those deserve um, immediate attention. We also, so we urge the city to speed up 
progress on addressing those outstanding physical plan issues. Um, the other main issue is routine maintenance. So particularly with respect to weekends and evenings, um, just general cleaning and maintenance of facilities is a huge thing that sparks complaints to us. Um, I'll particularly note that bathroom cleanliness is an ongoing issue. Every time we go out, either in the evenings or on the weekends, it's something that we almost always encounter. Um, and I think that uh, speaks to the need for additional staff and, and regular cleaning, particularly at sites that house a large number of people um, who are using a lot of bathrooms and um, need that regular cleaning. But we also wanted to, to talk a little bit about the well-founded concerns about just the general lack of dignity that many people experience and feel when they're living in the shelter system. Uh, we know that shelters are not homes, but some of the daily conditions and practices serve to make the experience of homelessness even more traumatic and dehumanizing for individuals and families. So some such practices, as many of you may have heard of before, include requiring individuals to request toilet paper every time they need to use the restroom, uh, being provided with low quality food, not enough food, being denied second portions of food, um, and not being provided with adequate laundry services. These are just some examples of just daily conditions that could be improved uh, with respect to the dignity of, sh of individuals living in shelters. And lastly, I just want to emphasize more than anything that we cannot continue to accept record homelessness in an ever-expanding shelter system as an ongoing reality. Uh, we've worked together with partner organizations, many of whom are here today, and council members, uh, including those on this committee, faith leaders, and other New Yorkers to push for the mayor to build more housing for homeless New Yorkers, and we will continue to do that. And we want to thank Councilmember Levin and Councilmember Salamanca for being such strong supporters of that. Thank you. As Giselle stated, uh, I'm Beth Hoffmeister. I'm from the Legal Aid Society, and we submit a joint testimony with, co with Coalition for the Homeless. <clears throat> and I'm here to talk a little bit more specifically about each of the bills. We thank you all, you both, and everyone else who was here earlier for your leadership and these issues in general um, and other related legislation that you both have put forward since you've been uh, council members. Um, in regards to Intro 915 regarding the quarterly reports, um, I think we've spoken about this uh, offline, but we are concerned about some of the unintended consequences of the bills, and we want to continue to work with you on finessing the language to make sure that we get it just right. Um, as you know, those are primarily around um, how the information about where the shelters are reported, specifically the details around um, the community boards and districts where they're located. As, an, as an, a person, an objective person, I completely understand why council members would want to have that information, and I don't think um, you know, the people who are in this room are very thoughtful and understand why that would be necessary and helpful for the purposes of supporting the communities. I think the unintended consequences of that are when it's public information, who else has access to that information and what their motivations are um, for dealing with that. I think the stigmatizing of homeless population, some of which was even alluded to here at times when um, in the way that people were talking about, um, you know, what it's like for our clients and our community members to go through this experience is a very real thing. And I think um, there can be some unintended risk that happens when certain people can get a hold of that information and want to use it um, for the purposes of um, targeting certain communities. We've seen that happen in various communities, um, unfortunately, over the past couple of years. And I think that it can sometimes unintentionally, we found it, unintentionally prevent the opening of new shelters. Um, I think there are ways that we can all work together to get a, over these barriers, but I, I want to make sure that we just touch on them as, as being possible issues. Similarly, in intro um, 1110, um, just the, regarding the reporting requirements, because um, a, a DV shelters and uh, uh, locations where individuals with HIV AIDS are living, or you know, there's very strong confidentiality concerns. Even as someone who advocates on behalf of people in domestic violence shelter, I don't know where those shelters are. It's very important that they stay extremely confidential. And any risk that we have of um, opening up the locations of, of those uh, facilities is, could really put those clients and those people at risk. So we just want to make sure that those are being taken into consideration um, within the larger context of those bills. Um, regarding transfers, obviously, um, and I wish he hadn't left because we would be happy to <laughs> work with him on the issues that Ms. Castillo is facing, but um, uh, 1232, 1233, and 884, the bills related to shelter transfers, we really can't underscore that um, as with anything related to the extremely tight capacity, that's when shelters are very tight, the breakdown in all systems begins to happen, and that is also seen with transfers. Um, so it's 
continues to be important to focus on affordable housing and focus on getting people into things like, you know, permanent housing, supportive housing, which just to reiterate is different than shelter, again, um, to make sure that um, people can, there can be a little bit of room to negotiate when people actually need to transfer because they're requesting it or when, um, as Commissioner Banks was talking about, they literally don't have room for a certain population. They have to shut down a whole shelter to transfer it over. Those things wouldn't have to happen as much. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, thank you Beth. Uh, just very quickly, uh, is somebody from the administration here? I didn't think so. <laughs> Anyone from the administration? Okay. If we have his contact information, we're happy to follow up. Okay. The man who testified. Thank you. Good afternoon, Councilmember Levin, uh, Councilmember Salamanca. My name is Catherine Trapani. I am the Executive Director of Homeless Services United. I'm gonna, you know, briefly go through. I've submitted more detailed written testimony, but I think that um, the scope of today's hearing is really focusing on the well-being of folks that are living in shelter, and there are two things that that we can do to make sure that that things improve and that we're we're staying the course with the promise reformed and that is actually delivering the promised funds to improve conditions in shelter commissioners uh, banks spoke extensively about the capital commitment and other dollars for services and so on so let's make sure that that money actually gets out the door and in the hands of providers to implement so that's the first thing that you could do to make a tremendous difference in in the way people experience uh, shelter services and and then the other thing that you can do is to do everything that you can to put up enough new both shelter and permanent housing to ease the capacity crisis. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about transfers. We've talked a lot about conditions. Um, I think that you wouldn't need to transfer people quite so much if the first placement was the best placement. And the only way to do that is to make sure that there's sufficient shelter capacity citywide to make sure that when someone is presenting at intake with their kids that there really is a vacancy in the in the area where their children are already enrolled in school for example um, other kinds of transfers that I know people experience as retaliatory um, related to conditions in the shelter if the provider in that shelter doesn't have the resources to cure the condition that make the client want the transfer the only way to actually help that person is to move them and that no one's happy when that happens right and so I, I think we really need to focus on on the dollars and cents that can make all of the reforms that Commissioner Banks spoke about real and operational on the ground. Last report HSU got was that there were over 400 contract amendments still pending somewhere in the uh, registration process that was holding up necessary funding to um, restore services and, and repair. So, so that is hugely important. Um, I'm going to speak specifically um, with respect to easing the capacity crisis and, and citing new shelters. I echo the concerns that Beth just shared about the unintended consequences of Intro 915. I completely get that the intent is actually quite the opposite. It's to spur development in, in districts that don't have sufficient shelter capacity, but I think that um, you know, when information is deployed and put in the wrong hands, sometimes the opposite can happen. So we'd love to work with you on how to finesse that. Um, with respect to the bills on uh, transfers, I think that the information and the transparency to clients would go a long way to improving their experience. Um, but again, you know, if you really want to get at the issue, let's make it so that transfers aren't necessary as often in the first place. Um, and then also work, of course, with the city and state on evolving regulations to make sure that any local law that we do put into place actually strengthens the regulation rather than um, perhaps conflicts. Um, and if I may just really quickly um, say thank you um, for intro 1110 that would invest additional services and housing specialists um, in shelters. We certainly need, as uh, Council Member Levin, you noted earlier in this hearing, um, it, conditions aren't just about bricks and mortar, but are really about services. So the intent of 1110, I think, is really great. But I, I share the reporting concerns that, that Beth pointed out about shelter locations. Um, and finally, with respect to the customer service training on Intro 883, um, we absolutely support new training. Um, I actually just last Friday did a training on customer service and shelter. I'd love to be able to do more of that. For us, it's a, it's a resource issue, um, and we're happy to share our curriculum with the council and brainstorm ways to make sure that um, more uh, enhanced training can be deployed system-wide. So thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chair Levin and Council Member Salamanca. 
Um, my name is Laura Mishu, and I'm the Executive Director of the Supportive Housing Network of New York. And on behalf of the network, I appreciate this opportunity to talk about Intro 915. As you know, we're a membership organization representing over 200 nonprofits throughout the state that own and operate supportive housing. Uh, supportive housing is permanent um, affordable housing that is in, with embedded social services to ad help address and reintegrate individuals and families and youth back into the community who have special interests, um, social issues such as mental health, substance abuse, HIV AIDS, and really rely on the supportive housing to leave chronic homelessness. Um, so we are very grateful for the city's NYC 1515 commitment to create 15,000 new units and are very thrilled with the council's um, budget addition this past year to move up that production from 500 to 700 units to accelerate the plan. As you know, Intro 915 specifically requires DSS to report on the number of congregate and scattered site supportive units in each council district and community district. And while we appreciate and understand the importance of the transparency, we believe that reporting supportive housing in this context will in, in effect hinder development. Um, this this intro 915 can be used to buttress the notion that supportive housing is a negative asset in communities and 30 years of experience in developing and running supportive housing speaks to the contrary as do numerous studies. Not only does supportive housing accomplish the social good of ending homelessness, amongst the most vulnerable of New Yorkers who are otherwise cycling the streets, shelters, psychiatric institutions, and hospital beds. Supportive housing residences also create deeply affordable housing for the community, as most residents set aside 40% of the units. And supportive housing development also creates jobs with both construction um, and for the individuals who work in those buildings. Um, based on the network's extensive experience assisting our members with supportive housing development, we are afraid that 915 would impede that development. The reporting requirement will result in communities and council districts shutting their doors to additional residences. Stakeholders that have supportive housing in their districts will look at numbers out of context and declare a moratorium on new supportive housing. In our 30-year history, this has occurred as certain community boards have refused to hear proposals on residences and slowed or stopped development in those areas. And opposition to supportive housing often stems from stigma, misinformation, and fear. However, once a supportive housing residence opens, a community's fears almost always disappear as the residence blends into the fabric of the neighborhood. And I would just like to encourage, we gave you a one-pager to maybe take a more um, positive approach and then that LA is taking with everyone in LA, where each council member has pledged to take a chunk of that goal and to work to ensure that units are developed in their district. And this is through really education, forums, um, identifying sites within the community and working with faith-based organizations. And we really wanna see in this legislation, um, if it is to move forward, what is the real incentive for communities to take supportive housing as the answer to chronic homelessness? Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to this entire panel. Um, Laura, to your last point, um, I see Brenda Rosen is here from Breaking Ground, and we um, are really excited to be doing a large-scale Breaking Ground project at 90 Sand Street in my district, um, which will be about 300 units of supportive and 200 units of permanently affordable, um, the former um, Jehovah's Witness uh, dormitory building. Mm -hmm. um, and we did a tour of the building a couple of uh, couple months ago and looked out over um, uh, basically looked like looked out towards city hall and um, you couldn't there's i don't think there's any better views in in new york city uh, than from uh, from the top of this building and i'm excited that um, uh, it will be for supportive housing and mm -hmm. uh, we got to work with the community to make sure that it uh, uh, that it's welcomed and that their concerns are addressed um, but uh, we at the council supported it with capital dollars. So I want to thank the speaker, Speaker Corey Johnson, for doing that, and um, and we're excited about it. And uh, and so, you know, I hope that uh, that every district is uh, is fortunate enough to have uh, such an investment in in long term, permanent, affordable, and supportive housing. Yeah. So, but then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Rafael Salamanca. Uh, thank you, Chair Levin. Um, first, I want to thank you all for testifying. Um, I, I really respect the work that you all do. Um, and as, as you know, um, in the last couple of months, I've been focusing on how to figure out how to get 
individuals who are ready for independent living, how to get them into permanent housing, and that's 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 important to me. Um, but also, as a, as a as a former community board tool member, I understand that there are certain communities, such as the one that I represent, that are doing more than their fair share when we're talking about homelessness and homeless shelters in their districts. And there are more affluent communities with their representatives who may come here and speak about how we're gonna reduce the number of homeless families or homeless individuals, but are not doing their part in their communities. And I feel that this report, this reporting mechanism will highlight that. And you know, we'll, we'll take that argument from them. Um, something that I wanna point out, um, intro 915 and, and 1110, um, th there is no intent at all to include addresses uh, in, uh, when reporting. Um, and I, and especially domestic violence, I, I understand the sensitivity of that. I know I have a few domestic violence uh, shelters in my, in my district and um, I don't know where they're at, you know, but they do come meet with me to, 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 to seek support, which we do when we allocate the funding. Uh, so it's just something that I do want to point out. And then finally, um, normally when a non-for-profit is going to come in and build in, 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 a, in, a, in a community, they normally seek the support of, a, of the local community board and the local member. They actually ask for a letter of support. They make a presentation at that local community board. Um, and if we're, and when they are talking about supportive housing, such as, I know that um, Breaking Ground is here, I, I don't know if they're gonna speak. You know, when I first got elected, maybe two years ago, I approved one of the biggest projects in my district called La Central, where over 180 units uh, were for, 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 for supportive housing, which breaking ground will be the landlord and community life will be the provider. Mm -hmm. I mean, this project went through intense scrutiny. It went to the community board. It had many hearings here. We had a big groundbreaking. Everyone in the community knows that there's gonna be supportive housing in that building. It was advertised. And, and I, I, I do not see the stigma there. Actually, I think that's a benefit for the community, not to mention that that project, 100% uh, of it will be affordable mixed income. And so therefore, I just feel, and, and we can continue to have conversations, I feel that communities should know what's in their districts. Um, we can have conversations about addresses. I think that maybe that's a different conversation. There's a sensitivity with, to that and there's a stigma to that, but I can understand that. But, Every not-for-profit that wants to build in the community goes to the local community board and they seek a letter of support. Um, uh, the only circumstance is this when we're talking about domestic violence. So I think the community board knows where it's at and it's only appropriate if communities know how many of these programs they have in their communities when we're, we're, we're having conversations about fair share. Thank you. Thank you very much to this panel. I look forward to working with you. And obviously, we've covered a range of issues yeah. today, so um, all of them um, deserve their, you know, their own uh, time. And so we look forward to working with you throughout the, the rest of, uh, maybe not for the rest of this year because we're almost at the holidays break, but uh, but obviously in the in the next year on uh, on all these issues because we can and we should be doing better than uh, than we are today. So thank you. Thanks. Next up, Jennifer March. Rand, Jennifer Marshall from Citizens Committee for Children, Randy Levine, Advocates for Children, Sasha Alexander, uh, Sylvia Rivera Larp, Law Project, India Rodriguez, Sylvia Rivera Law Project, and Brenda Rosen from Breaking Ground. Whoever wants to begin. Do you want to start with the addresses and then I'll go next? <coughs> okay, it's okay, I'll go and then um, another person is testifying. Hi y'all, good afternoon. Uh, members of the General Welfare Committee, thank you for holding this hearing. My name is Sasha Alexander. I've been before you many times to testify um, on behalf of the Sylvia Rivera Law Project. <coughs> Excuse me and specifically our communities of trans and gender nonconforming folks 
who are low and no income in New York City, particularly transgender and non-conforming people of color. So we've had a shelter organizing team that's formed as a result of the alarming safety issues, many of which some of the introductions you created are actually addressed, so we were very excited to see that. Uh, we also know, though, that TGNC people are, um, are disproportionately um, treated with discrimination and harassment and violence in the shelter system. And so our, on our own, we've been creating our own Know Your Rights uh, materials and releasing those to the community. Uh, and what we found is that, um, you know, as community-based organizations, we shouldn't even have to be the ones releasing this information to the community, that this, com this information should be posted and made available. So again, we uh, appreciate a lot of the introductions that you all have made. And so in terms of uh, 883, we're, we were excited to see the training would occur and, and the amount of which, uh, however, we felt that twice enough was not enough and uh, India will expand upon that. Um, we also felt that in terms of 884, um, providing a monthly report to the speaker on transfers was great. However, we didn't know if there was also the ability to do the same with grievances or if that's already happening and if a report is issued to city council on those. We feel like grievances and transfers are really related and a lot of times there's issues that our members have filed grievances for that haven't been addressed and as people already testified, they're retaliated against as a result. Um, I know folks raised issues with 915 in terms of listings. I think um, we do feel like that information has not been accessible enough to the community members who need it. And actually, we were wondering if that was going to happen, if something could be in print, as a lot of our community members don't have access to a computer. There's not computers on sites in the shelter system. Um, and that would guarantee more people would be able to see it. Uh, in terms of 110, um, or I'm sorry, 110, um, we felt like this was one of the most helpful tools in terms of requiring reporting on housing specialists and goals and timetables, but we weren't sure will the commissioner really have the capacity to assess all of these and provide adequate support because the burden is really falling on our community members to do the research, to do the advocacy, and to do their own monitoring or our, on our organizations. Um, in terms of 1232, uh, a lot of our members were disappointed to know that this didn't already exist. Um, and, you know, in terms of posting signage, we feel like it's critical in all languages for our folks. Uh, and we do want to point out that many of our members have uh, disabilities, including vision, and that accommodations should be made to make sure the information that is being shared uh, visually is shared verbally with folks who might need that. Um, we also appreciated the specificity of what will be posted and wanted to uh, share that we were shocked that information on grievance forms would not be included. They're supposed to be available in every shelter. There's been a major issue with grievance forms not being available in the shelter. Uh, and finally, just to speak about 1233, we felt this was also critical um, in terms of a lot of people in our community having transfers used against them uh, and or being transferred because of the safety issues we face and feeling that, as other folks have said, there's some very kind of cruel and unusual treatment in that transfer process in terms of uh, how the per the, what the person knows about where they're going, their support to actually get to the site. Uh, and so again, I just want to thank you all for your time today. Um, and if you want to speak more with our shelter organizing team or about how this is impacting trans and gender nonconforming communities, we really want to speak with you. So thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, sorry, before the next, I just want to be clear. Is there, is there anybody here representing the administration or communicating back to the administration? Anybody at all? Okay, yes, okay, thank you. Go ahead. Oh. Good afternoon, members of the City Council. My name is India Rodriguez. My gender pronoun is she, her, ella, and I'm an active member of the Silver Law Project and one of the leaders in the shelter organizing team, the Prison Advisory Committee. I'm an transgender HIV activist currently residing in East New York. As per intro 883, I feel two trainings per year would not be sufficient to address the complex needs of folks within the shelter setting. They either have long-standing mental health or histories of trauma, particularly when inefficiencies arise, coping or navigating within the shelter setting. I feel that qualified licensed staff need to be in place to work closely with clients as well as staff in the shelter setting to thoroughly implement a trauma-informed approach and maintain professionalism and the proficiency. As per intro 1110, I'm in support of this. 
I'm in support of this, particularly because I am a member of, I am a member and a client of Housing Works. And as a person that struggles with HIV and stuff, I presently live in a scattered site apartment. Part of my lease agreement was that there was a case management component to my lease agreement. And part of that component was to assist me in navigating and accessing and, you know, giving me resources and the help that I needed and the support that I needed to be able to eventually transition out of transition housing into permanent housing. Unfortunately, that's been non-existent at all, at all. The only time she comes around, the, 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 the housing developer comes around is when there's an audit and her, her folders need to look a particular kind of way, which is sad and very frustrating. You know, I go to school, I have a partner that has developmental delay, I'm his guardian, I'm the only one sole provider for my, for my partner, and it just like manif magnifies my situation. You know, I've been here already two years, I'm at the end of my lease agreement, and the only response I'm getting from these staff members is that, listen, you're at the end of your lease agreement, unfortunately, you have to move out. And you need to go to HRA and tell them that you need emergency placement in our SRO. Part of the reason why I'm HIV positive, many, many years ago before they implemented all these changes where now you could go into a housing based on their identity, was because that, that was non-existent. I was thrust into a shelter in Wards Island, subsequently I was raped, and that's why I'm HIV positive now. So going into a shelter setting is a big trigger for me. You know, it's very traumatic for me, you know. So I've been doing all the footwork, I've been doing as much as possible, but you know, the looming threat of the possibility of being homeless is there, you know, and implementing this would be a very help because it ha actually gives, there's oversight and holds people accountable in these positions to do their job, basically. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. My name is Randy Levine and I'm policy director of Advocates for Children of New York. Advocates for Children focuses on providing students with a high quality education with a particular focus on students from low income backgrounds. We're proud to house the New York State Technical and Education Assistance Center for Homeless Students, which works on several thousands of cases each year regarding the educational needs of students in temporary housing in New York. I agree with my colleagues who earlier talked about the importance of maintaining school stability and whenever possible, placing families in shelter in the same community as their children's school. Given the number of families, however, who are being placed in a different borough from the school of their youngest children, it's also important to have a transparent process for transferring to a shelter closer to school. While there is currently a process for DHS to approve shelter transfers for reasons related to children's education, the availability of such transfers and the process to request one are not well publicized. As a result, families and even shelter staff often do not know about the availability of transfers for school-related reasons or how to request such a transfer. We have seen the positive impact of school-based shelter transfers. For example, we requested a shelter transfer for a family whose children attended a school in Brooklyn but had been placed in a shelter in the Bronx. The bus picked up the children at 5.10 in the morning and did not drop them off until 6.30 in the evening. The long commute was taking a toll on the children. After we reached out to DHS, DHS granted a transfer to a shelter in Brooklyn, vastly reducing the children's commute and making it possible for them to stay in their original school. We have another case example in our testimony as well, in our written testimony. However, these families did not know that they could ask for a shelter transfer until they were connected with Advocates for Children. While DHS may not be able to transfer every child who would benefit from being closer to school, it's important for families to know that shelter transfers for school-related reasons are possible and to know the process. We appreciate that intro 1232 would require shelters to post signs with information for families about shelter transfers. We recommend that the council amend this bill to include the process for requesting transfers for school related reasons on these signs. And our written testimony has included recommended language to add to intro 1232 for this purpose. 
Our testimony also makes a num number of additional recommendations to help students and children living in shelters. To go through a few of them, the city should increase the number of Bridging the Gap social workers from 69 to 100 and baseline the funding. The city should launch an education support center at PATH and ensure that Department of Education staff meet with every family applying to shelter to discuss their educational options, where their children are going to go to school and how to get there. The city should amend its child care plan to make all children living in shelter eligible for subsidized child care so that no child living in shelter is left out of early learn programs. And our written testimony contains several additional recommendations for ensuring that children and students living in shelters can access the child care and educational supports they need to be successful and to stop this cycle of poverty and homelessness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Jennifer March. I'm the executive director of Citizens Committee for Children. And in the interest of time, because many of my colleagues have um, really, my testimony would echo many of the things that Randy and previous colleagues have said. Um, I'm going to focus exclusively on, on two specific things. Um, in terms of intro 884 and 915, um, I would preface my remarks by saying that Citizens Committee for Children over 25 years has built the largest municipal database on children and families in the country, so we do believe in the power of data. Uh, and we're looking forward to working with you uh, to ensure that data is collected in a way that helps us not only understand the needs of who are at risk of homelessness and homeless, but what is happening in the system overall. I'm relieved that Councilmember Salamanca has said that identifying information on location wouldn't be included in the bill. I think that that will help. And I would urge the Council to focus as well on other, um, in addition, other data collection efforts on demographics and program information that would help us assess how the city is making progress, both at preventing families from coming into the shelter system, addressing their needs while in shelter, and ensuring that they're not only in purpose-built shelters, but uh, achieve safe, stable, permanent housing. Um, I've listed a couple of um, ideas in the testimony, but there are two in particular that I'll raise right now. First is that DHS has the capacity to produce for us a demographic profile of who homeless families are to um, identify age, race, gender of the adult household head, his or her education level and work status, as well as the number and age range of children in, in the household. This type of information would actually help us understand whether or not the shelter system has the capacity to support children and families while in shelter, and also more importantly, once they move to permanent housing, ensure that we're connecting that family to essential community supports. As well, um, we would encourage exploration of uh, collecting information on the percent of young children in shelter that are enrolled in early education after school and summer programs. There's a wide network of supports available for children and families in this city, and unfortunately, oftentimes our homeless families are um, not aided sufficiently to connect to the things that exist that reduce social isolation and promote well-being. And then lastly, I would say we have to also focus on the urgent need to improve the conditions in hotels. I know that we don't want hotels to be a permanent option, um, but there might be, in fact, um, time-limited, cost-effective things that we could do to ensure that families in hotels have access to laundry, nutritious food, recreational facilities, and transportation, again, to reduce their social isolation and really acknowledge that these are human beings living in rooms they must uh, move from every 30 days, and it's really just incredibly problematic. And then last but not least, um, I look forward to working with the City Council and our colleagues to make sure the Council plays an essential role to help New Yorkers embrace who, in fact, is homeless. These are young mothers with young children, and they desperately want to regain stability and benefit from a safe home and to be part of a community. And on that note, in addition to supporting uh, Councilmember Salamanca's bill to increase set-asides, as well as Hevesy's bill to establish a permanent rent, uh, uh, rent subsidy. Um, I would encourage um, us to all work together to make sure that we could have resources at the state or local level to embed a community-based service coordinator in communities, in multi-service organizations that currently serve families and children to make sure while in shelter and once permanent housing is achieved that we're connecting families to the things that support well-being. Thank you. Thank you very much for that testimony.
look forward to working with you as well. Moving forward. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairman Levin and Council Member Salamanca. Nice to see you both. My name is Brenda Rosen. I'm President and CEO of Breaking Ground, New York City's largest developer and operator of supportive housing for low-income and chronically homeless New Yorkers. I also serve as the chair of the board of directors of the Supportive Housing Network of New York and as a board member of Homeless Services United. So we're grateful for the opportunity to testify before the Committee on General Welfare regarding Intro 915. Breaking Ground currently operates over 20 buildings, more than 4,000 units of permanent and transitional housing in Manhattan, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Queens and has a development pipeline of more than 1,000 housing units over the next five years. We also manage the street outreach program, Street to Home in Brooklyn, Queens, and Midtown Manhattan, which connects the most entrenched long-term homeless individuals with housing and other critical services. Breaking Ground operates programs and housings, housing in the council districts of almost every member of this committee. Your commitment, your partnership makes our work and, our cru and crucially our success possible. Together over the last 28 years, with your support, we have helped over 14,000 people escape homelessness, including veterans, seniors, artists, youth aging out of foster care, those living with addiction and chronic illness, and many more. The, ser the city is facing a serious homeless and affordable housing crisis. To reach our shared goals of bringing people off the streets and into housing, we need to strengthen every part of the continuum of services, including street outreach, emergency shelters, transitional housing, and permanent supportive and affordable housing. The ability to deliver this continuum of services from street to home relies heavily on community support. To get there, we have had to overcome countless misconceptions and loads of opposition over the years. However, through strong collaboration with key community stakeholders, such as East Brooklyn Congregation and South Bronx Churches, along with you and your colleagues across the city, we have been able to increase community engagement and education and overcome community fears. Communities that once feared us now see us as strong assets. But still, there's a lot of work to do. Most people still don't understand the need for or the extraordinary benefits of supportive housing. The proposed intro 915 bill has the potential to set us backwards. This bill treats supportive housing as different and distinct from other types of permanent affordable housing, which only serve to further stigmatize it as undesirable and perpetuate the fears we've all worked so hard to change. Two goals of the 1515 plan to create 15,000 new units of supportive housing were to streamline development and improve community engagement for new housing. This bill does not address those aims, instead creates a new reporting requirement that would seem to label supportive housing as a negative for communities across New York City. This will inevitably slow or halt the production of new supportive housing units along with much needed affordable housing in community boards and council districts across the city. <coughs> Rather, our focus should be on educating the community on the benefits of supportive housing. Supportive housing is a proven positive ending chronically homeless chronic homelessness, adding affordable housing to the community, improving property values, reducing crime, and creating jobs. Breaking ground and our partners in the supportive housing sector often include community assets such as storefronts that are home to new retail or community-based organizations, meeting spaces that can be used by community members and local precincts, community gardens and public plazas that increase green space, and community-focused programming that engages with neighborhoods and around our residences. Repri requiring reporting of unit counts without other context will lead some community boards and council districts to call for delays or even a freeze in the siting of shelters and supportive housing. It's happened before and we fear it'll happen again and that cannot come at a worse time. Last year, the council requested that we accelerate it, uh, that the that funding be accelerated to produce new supportive units from 500 to 700 per year. We applaud that goal. To achieve it, it will need new partnerships between communities and supportive housing developers, and we have seen such partnerships succeed time and time again. This bill, however, will make our work with communities more difficult. So we urge the council to, to encourage more collaboration between communities and supportive housing developers so that project siting and construction can happen faster. 
Doing so will build momentum to help move people out of shelters and off the streets to permanent homes, paired with on-site services that they need to remain stable in housing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Salamanca. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, I want to thank you all for coming and testifying. Um, I want to congratulate you guys on, you know, really telling your story. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about the work that I'm doing in my council district when it comes to LGBT, working in partnership with Councilmember Richie Torres, we allocated half a million dollars uh, to Destination for Tomorrow to provide a safe space for the LGBT community. And not too long ago, about a year ago, I approved the project of 1490 Southern Boulevard, which is a SARA program. 30% of those units, uh, SARA program is for, is for senior housing. 30% of those units are for homeless seniors, which there will be a not-for-profit there. And the other 70% would be for seniors making 60% of the AMI or below. Uh, but what's interesting about that, pro uh, that project is that we have a community set aside in which the LGBT network will be moving in there in my district. So it's just two, two projects that we worked on recently really to, to ensure that we have a safe space for the LGBT community. Um, and then, you know, just to go back to my comments, the bill 915 and 1110 uh, does not require uh, that addresses of, of, of where supportive housing or these homeless shelters are at. Th that reporting, that mechanism, that, that information was not required there. And then going back to breaking grounds, you know, we do great work together. I've seen the work you've done in my community. Um, we met not too long ago, and I go back to that project, La Central, where it's over a little under 1,000 units, and you went to multiple layers to get community support. The community knows that that project is there, and you've gotten full support from that community. The whole basis of this uh, uh, um, bill is just to inform the community of what's in their community and allow us who are oversaturated with shelters to, uh, to go to our colleagues and say, you need to do your part other than sit here and talk about how we're gonna decrease um, homelessness. Well, you can do your part by opening up your doors in your communities. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Salamanca. I wanna thank this panel uh, for all the good work that you do um, and I look forward to continuing to work with all of you um, so that we can do a better job. The next uh, panel, Talia Gruber, Tawaki Kamatsu, Raisa Rodriguez, Nicole McVinua, and Barry Campbell. Yeah, you put it in an envelope. Okay, whoever wants to begin. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Levin and Council Members. Uh, my name is Nicole McVinnu and I am the policy analyst at Urban Pathways. On behalf of the organization, thank you for the opportunity to testify on Intro 915 today. Uh, Urban Pathways is a nonprofit that provides services to chronically homeless individuals through a unique combination of street outreach, safe havens, extended stay residences, permanent supportive housing, and employment programs. Our programs engage homeless adults to come inside and to succeed and thrive as they move forward. We want to expand our capacity to serve, the, to serve the most vulnerable New Yorkers, and in order to do so, we need to open additional program sites. The most difficult aspect of this process is citing locations and gaining approval from the local community. Uh, we recognize that Intro 915 has good intentions of encouraging citing in districts where supportive housing is lacking. However, we share the fears of HSU, Breaking Ground, the network, and others um, that it's intended uh, effect will actually be that the opposite will occur of its actual attendant, intended effect. Um, those who view the numbers out of context are likely to use them as a bolstering reason to resist supportive housing and homeless services in their community. This could lead to a chilling effect on siting, making it impossible to find locations to build critically needed supportive housing and safe havens. 
Um, the council has shown unwavering support of supportive housing through the NYC 1515 commitment. We thank you for the support and we do not want to see an inability to site hinder the council's accelerated timeline of 700 units a year. Um, further reporting out on the number of these different types of housing sites together could increase misunderstandings about these different models. For instance, with the city's commitment to close cluster sites, we want to see these numbers going down, while simultaneously we want to see the number of supportive housing units going up. Reporting these numbers out together could easily cause confusion around what constitutes a good or a bad number or what models we want to see increasing or decreasing in districts. And this could again lead to increased resistance if supportive housing is uh, accidentally equated with cluster sites. Um, as an alternative to reporting numbers of supportive housing already in each district, uh, we would like to draw the committee's attention to the successful pledge campaign uh, in the city of Los Angeles, another major city with a growing homelessness crisis, um, as Laura alluded to earlier. LA has committed to building 10,000 units of supportive housing, and in order to meet this goal, each of the city's council members has committed to building a proportion of units in their district. Uh, this has created a spirit of everyone working together towards a common goal and taking part in meeting the city's needs. We believe this is an effective example of how districts can come together to encourage more supportive housing throughout the city, uh, rather than pointing fingers. Uh, in closing, Urban Pathways opposes Intro 915 for its negative potential impact on siting. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Make sure the red light is on. Oh, you got it. Um, good afternoon and thank you to the Committee on General Welfare for holding this hearing. My name is Talia Gruber. I'm the Economic Empowerment Specialist at the New York City Anti-Violence Project. I work on financial stability with LGBTQ survivors of violence, many of whom have interacted with the DHS system, and I'm here to comment on several of the bills under discussion um, to reflect some of the concerns shared by my clients. Uh, Intro 83, as was discussed, is a well-intentioned bill that needs to be expanded to make it effective. It is crucial that DHS be comprehensive in outlining what these customer service trainings must address and who will be providing them. Many of our transgender and gender nonconforming clients have been harassed, misgendered, and outed as transgender by security guards and staff in shelter. We have seen several incidents this year where our clients, particularly those who are transgender women of color, are denied entry by staff into shelters that match their gender identity, and when they react in justified enmity, staff members have called the police to have them removed from the premises. What happened to Jasmine Healy was not an isolated incident, as happens to our communities constantly. Culturally competent trainings for staff members needs to take into account the specific needs of LGBTQ communities, especially of TGNC people of color. DHS needs to include trainings on de-escalation that specifically highlight conflict resolution strategies that do not include calling the police. When our clients have the police called on them for matters that could easily be addressed interpersonally, or when our clients have no choice but to leave shelter because of negative interactions with staff members that go unaddressed, our clients are denied the basic human right to shelter. This issue extends far beyond customer service training and requires DHS to implement clear methods of evaluation and, accounta and accountability measures for shelter staff. In regards to intro 884 and 1232, problems, as many folks have stated here, with transfers and shelters extend far beyond issues with reporting and appeals. At AVP, we continue to see clients who require high levels of advocacy from us in order to have their emergency transfer request taken seriously and in a timely manner. We have had numerous clients this year who are being harassed in shelter because of their gender identity and were subsequently denied valid and time-sensitive emergency transfers, putting them at further risk of harm. Further, many of our clients who are survivors of intimate partner violence often reside in homeless shelter when there is no space in DV shelter. As a result, their abusive partners are more easily able to locate them and when there is no knowledge, which there is not, about how to get timely safety transfers, or when DHS staff do not address these transfers swiftly, these clients are often forced to leave shelter or face increased risk of harm. It is crucial that safety transfers are evaluated in a more culturally competent and timely manner, and that information about how to successfully request a transfer be more clearly available to shelter residents. Thank you for the work that you've done to implement necessary changes to the homeless shelter system. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tawaki Komatsu. I've testified to you previously. Um, to begin my testimony, I'll play an audio recording for you. Um, earlier today, there was uh, Stephen Banks of HRA testifying to you yet again, falsely, under oath, 
I sent you an email while sitting in the chair um, to point out to you uh, what specifically he testified falsely about. So let's have everyone in this room hear what Stephen Banks had to say to me on December 14th in Brooklyn of last year. Uh, here, you want to speak to one of the inspectors? It's an HRA building. You have oversight. The police department is responsible for dealing with crime. We are not responsible for crime. If you would like to speak to a police uh, inspector right now, I'm happy to have you talk to That's not the issue. The issue is I told the HRA March 16th okay. that there was a video. He, he needs to move on. He's okay. 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 Thank you very much. That's good. You're going to so that's one audio recording I want to play for your benefit. Sorry, if you could just summarize what that, I don't so, I, I um, The hear. mayor had a public town hall meeting on December 20, um, sorry, December 14th last year. I confronted Mr. Banks lawfully about the fact that I was assaulted in an Urban Pathways building um, because Urban Pathways subjected me to an illegal bait and switch with regards to a lease agreement, a binding lease agreement that I signed on uh, February 16th in HRA's office at 33 Beaver Street. They forged my signature in a totally fraudulent lease agreement they didn't allow me to reside in the specific apartment I signed that lease agreement for. I thereafter was assaulted. I got 15, more than 15 punches to my left temple that I told you about previously in other meetings. I got a concussion from that. That concussion, it prevented me from interviewing effectively for a job that would have paid me 450 bucks a day. I now have a federal lawsuit against the city as well as the New York State Supreme Court lawsuit. So I've testified in your meetings. I uh, talked to Mr. Deutsch, Hein Deutsch about the fact that repairs aren't being made, people in the building where I reside for military veterans don't have a valid lease agreement. So if Mr. Banks said today that he doesn't put people in buildings where there's a risk, um, if I got 15 punches to my left temple, um, how exactly did he uh, testify truthfully? Also, Nic uh, Nicole Bramstedt, she testified to you on April 24th about how Urban Pathways double, doubles up people in apartments and that causes roommate conflict. She's now a member of the New York City Council. so. If she admitted to you in a public hearing that she's putting people in situations where they're subject to potential harm, why was she hired by the, the city council? So here's my last uh, recording for you. Um, sorry, excuse me one sec. Because I remember the last time when he went inside that basement, he and he said that he's gonna do this and he's not doing nothing. So what's that guy's name again? Uh, I don't know, he's a, he's a Dominican guy, a Spanish guy. Let me, but, let me yes, keep on going now. But, but he works for Urban? No, because he's the one, he's the one that, um, that runs this building. That's so, the problem. So here. that Dominican guy doesn't work for Urban? Yeah, him. exactly. No, but like I say, it's like I say, Urban Pastor is not the one that's supposed to do this. He's the one that's supposed to be doing this. And, and they're still not making repairs, right? Hey, you, you know, you, I'm gonna, he doesn't like when I be talking because he knows that my mouth is only to protect people, yeah. not to be hurting people. Of course. And that's hurting him because you're talking. Because he's an asshole. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's already hurting him. So that's the reason why he ain't taking off his phone. Because he already knows that when I call him, I'm going to start complaining about what's going on over here. Because he's already tired of hearing about this already. But do you think, see, it's like. See the problem there? Right, let me ask you a question then. You know Nitro, right? Yeah. They, they started with the repairs already. My, my, my question is, do you think this is any different from NYCHA? I mean, like, repairs not being made? Well, I'm going to tell you the truth. I think NYCHA is better than this right now. You think NYCHA is better than this? Uh, because they already, they already started doing the repairs. Right? But w which place do you think has the bigger rats, this place or that place? Well, I can, that I cannot tell you. But you but, see it, but, but I see, But you saw a big rat in this place, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that's what did I tell you. I told you this building is already on violation. But you said they're like as big as cats, right? <laughs> Everybody knows that, isn't it? She saw, the, uh, uh, she, she, the security saw a rat over there on the second floor yesterday on the other side. Yes, sir. Yeah, what'd you think? On the second that was an audio recording that I recorded from, um, of someone who works in the building uh, where I reside. He works for Urban Pathways. That recording was recorded on December 12th. So if I'm sitting in this chair on December 17th, I told Mr. Deutsch that previously during an earlier public hearing. Um, I also t testified to Richie Torres, who's a total fraudster. I testified to, him, to his face in March. He told me that he would have HPD uh, make repairs. I, uh, sorry, I talked to Mr. Banks yet again on August uh, 22nd. He told me that um, based on the complaints that I and other people have been making, repairs have been made, there's black mold in, a, in an apartment on the first floor of the building. So one of the things about NYCHA, they talked about how there's lead in buildings, there's black mold. So if I'm reporting violations on behalf of other tenants, things are getting fixed. And like I pointed out to you previously, taxpayers are paying for this building. 
Where the hell is oversight? I mean, that's the purpose of this hearing is to, I mean, certainly around shelter conditions is, is, a, is, is something. So we, certainly we can follow up on, on and those. And just to let you know, uh, with regards to my testimony today, it really wasn't for you. It's for Federal Judge Lorna Schofield that I have this federal lawsuit filed with, who's going to assi who's um, assigned to that case. Sure. So since this uh, public hearing is recorded on video, this video recording is going to be submitted to federal court. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Levin. How are you? Um, my name is Raisa Rodriguez. I'm Vice President of Policy and Planning at WIN. Uh, WIN is the largest provider of family shelter and supportive housing in New York City. Each year, uh, we serve about 2,700 families in New York City. And what I find most telling and I like to share and start with is that about 60% of our clients are actually children. Um, I won't share with you the numbers. I know you know the numbers inside out. Um, but we've been doing a lot of work from a policy standpoint, figuring out what we like um, to push, right, and work with our partners. Um, and we've been looking at what families and children need based on our data, right? And when it comes to what families and children need while they're in shelter, we have a good sense of what they need. We, we need adequate tier two capacity that is rich in services and trauma-informed care. Um, and beyond that, in order to really ensure housing stability, we need an adequate supply of affordable housing, right? And so with partners, we've been looking at ways to strategically um, reduce the number of barriers and roadblocks to those two things, which we know are incredibly in short supply. Um, and so we're here to share and echo a lot of the concerns that our partners have shared today about um, intro 915, 915. Um, because while it is good intentioned, we believe it does have a potential for increased confusion, right? Um, we share Salamanca's um, concerns and values around um, fair share. We believe every community in New York City um, has a responsibility for all of our kids, not just homeless kids, right? Um, but we do think that the reporting structure in this bill can lead to increased confusion. Um, I can tell you that in my role, part of what I do is kind of go out to communities where we're opening up shelters and begin to build bridges with community members, right? Um, and I can't tell you the amount of confusion that there is around who the homeless, who homeless families are, right? Um, what, how do we begin to demystify uh, what it means to be homeless um, and begin to reduce a lot of the fears that exist at a community level? Um, and I think that the reporting bill, or the bill as it stands, can lead to only more confusion. Um, so we welcome the opportunity to really think of more um, effective ways to increase transparency and to really um, have a more effective reporting structure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank this panel very much for your testimony and for calling to light uh, very important issues. Uh, and we'll continue to work with, with all of you in the coming year. Um, we still have a lot of work to do, so thank you. Next panel, Peter Malvin, uh, Wendy O. Shields, Jim Dill, Michelle DeMott, and Jelaine Altino. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Jelaine Altino. I am representing the New York City Coalition of Domestic Violence Residential Providers. It is a pleasure to be here today to offer comments on intro 1110. We are grateful to Council Member Salamanca and the supporting council members of this bill for proposing a creative and strategic plan to begin to address the housing crisis that exists in New York City. 
we, recommend, we commend the acknowledgement of such a service gap for the homeless population as described in the bill, and would also like to highlight the unique circumstances unique to our system when discussing homelessness and domestic violence. For years, affordable permanent housing has plagued clients residing in shelter. We understand that this is a priority for many families in shelter, but for many others, healing from their trauma involves more than just securing permanent housing. For a victim of domestic violence, the dedicated DV shelters are places where survivors seek safety, comfort, and healing. Our shelters provide supportive services util utilizing client-centered and trauma-informed approaches. The staffing at our agencies undergo extensive training to ensure that the services delivered to the families are of the highest quality, aligned with the values embedded in said practices. Currently, many shelters do have dedicated housing specialists on site. If having a housing specialist in all temporary shelters were the intended mechanism to carry out the goal of this bill, then we would ask that the bill uh, provide an opportunity for HRA to fund housing specialists that would be employed by the agency in all DV shelters, as opposed to having housing specialists designated by HRA operate within shelters. This would allow such staff to work within the mission of the agency while still addressing the service gap, which has been raised by this bill. The coalition feels that this consistency of service delivery by staff employed by the individual agencies would ensure that housing specialists are trained to the agency standards and, also, and would also streamline the coordination of care. We additionally ask for further clarification on the requirement for training in, quote, proper case management techniques, close quote. The coalition believes that any training needs to be grounded in a thorough understanding of DV and trauma. Though having a housing specialist at all of the temporary shelters is an important piece to combat the issues related to the housing crisis, the regard to DV victims the concern that may not all lie in whether there is a housing specialist at a shelter, but rather the barriers that exist for our clients in securing affordable permanent housing. These barriers include, but are not limited to, finding housing in a safe borough designated by HRA through information gathered from the client's initial assessment, the real estate market in New York City, the less than adequate voucher amounts available for families to sustain housing, the unethical discriminatory landlord practices associated with the stigma of being a, de a victim of domestic violence, and the cumbersome process a victim must endure and comply with while conducting their search and piecing their lives together. These are just a few of the barriers that limit our clients' re out search and makes for a longer process to secure an affordable apartment. We also ask the committee to consider the largest reason for a lack of move outs into permanent housing, which is the lack of affordable, affordable housing, as said earlier. Through this bill, the city has a real opportunity to introduce a well thought out approach to combating the intersections of homelessness and DV. We look forward to working with the city during this hearing and hope by doing so we can promote the solidarity necessary to bring these concerns to light and improve efficacy. We thank you for your consideration and the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. My name is Wendy O'Shields and I'm a safety net activist founding member and a housing advocate. I'd like to call your attention to some pressing matters concerning the Department of Homeless Services. The City of New York Department of Homeless Services emergency shelters are funded by the United States HUD McKinney Vento dollars and are thereby contractually bound to enforce HUD McKinney Vento definitions, policies, and procedures at all. HUD McKinney Vento Homeless Assistance Act Rapid Rehousing to, um, Rapid Rehousing is di designed for U.S. shelters to house homeless single adults, couples, adult families, and families with minor children with the Housing First model. 
The HUD Housing First model has independent permanent housing and supportive housing components. Each shelter resident should be assessed for the type of housing they are eligible. Homeless residents that do not require services should not be illegally relegated to supportive housing with no need present. New York City DHS, the funding you receive from HUD McKinney Vento for emergency shelters are not to be used for transitional housing. Cease referring to your DHS shelters that you receive this funding as, tradition, as um, traditional housing, transitional, excuse me, transitional shelters. They are emergency shelters. NYC enforce the New York State Callahan Consent Decree et al. with extreme oversight to the shelter standards. A sleeping room in a single occupancy, um, in single occupancy sleeping rooms, a minimum of 80 square feet per resident shall be provided. Uh, number two, in sleeping rooms for two or more residents, a minimum of 60 square feet per resident shall be provided. Number three, a minimum of three feet, which is included in the per resident minima, shall be maintained between beds for aisles. Number four, partitioned sleeping areas from the areas shall be ceiling high and smoke tight. NYC enforce the use of the Department of Homeless Services involuntary transfer, which has rights and protections for the DHS shelter residents in lieu of <clears throat> the DHS administrative transfer, which has none. Eliminate the HUD McKinney Vento reset DHS administrative transfer, which occurs approximately every 24 months for each DHS single adult resident. Once the resident is transferred, their McKinney-Vento 24-month clock begins again. The Department of Homeless Services agency, um, agency's culture of violence, denial, degradation of human, right, of human beings is the DHS structure. This city agency thrives on abusing those they have, that they have in their care. The most vulnerable group of homeless residents are single adult women. Many, many immediate reforms are needed at the Department of Homeless Services to restore dignity of residents and to begin independent or supportive housing realities. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Levin. My name is Michelle DeMott, and I am the Chief of Staff to Mitchell Nedburn at Samaritan Daytop Village. On behalf of our organization, I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you on intro 915. Samaritan Daytop Village is a comprehensive health and human services agency with over 50 programs across 10 counties, including New York City. We offer a rich array of programs, including treatment for substance use disorder and behavioral health, transitional and supportive permanent housing, and innovative services for veterans, homeless individuals, women, children, youth, seniors, and families. Samaritan Daytop Village is one of the over 200 nonprofit operators of supportive housing represented, represented by the Supportive Housing Network of New York. As you heard in the earlier testimony, there are thousands of vulnerable New Yorkers who rely on supportive housing. Additionally, there are tens of thousands more in our New York City shelters unable to find affordable housing with extensive lengths of stay in those shelters, awaiting the availability of additional units of supportive permanent housing. There is an affordable housing crisis in New York City, and we are appreciative of the city's commitment to create 15,000 new units of supportive housing over the next 15 years in New York City 1515. We are even more appreciative of the council's recognition of the need and its request to accelerate the production of supportive housing units. As you are aware, intro 915 requires that the Department of Social Services submit to every council member and community board and post on its website quarterly reports on the number of shelters and supportive housing units. What the council, however, may not be aware of is its unintended consequences of the bill. While we understand the need for transparency in government and the importance of tracking data, we believe that for practical purposes, it will in fact hinder the development of the very units the council has requested to accelerate. 
the bill could be construed to support the premise that supportive housing is a negative, something to be reported on and contained. What we have seen at Samaritan Daytop Village when citing our shelter locations has been community opposition, fear, increased stigma, and NIMBY over and over again based on misinformation. We have faced protests and community residents who have angrily stated that violence and drug use has gone up in their communities as a result of the homeless. Residents have stated they feared for their elders and their children with the placements of shelters in their communities. The reporting required will likely result in these communities and council districts shutting their doors to additional residences, hindering the development of the additionally needed housing. Having operated supportive housing units, Samaritan Daytop Village has seen firsthand that it is in fact a positive asset to communities. Supportive housing accomplishes ending homelessness for many of the individuals we serve in shelter. Additionally, it has proven to increase property values, create jobs both during construction and permanently once the building is built, and it creates affordable housing. The Council has indicated its full support for the quick development of supportive housing in order to address New York City's affordable housing crisis. The Council should avoid at any measure that would hinder said development. Community opposition in finding sites has traditionally been the most difficult part of the development process. Why make it unintentionally worse? As a member of the Supportive Housing Network of New York, we support their proposal to the Council to, to follow an alternative approach based on an effort put forth in Los Angeles, another city combating a similar homelessness crisis. Formerly homeless individuals and families had faced adversity and stigma at every door. Supportive housing provides affordable housing for formerly homeless people with special needs. Why would we want to continue to reinforce the stigma? Supportive housing is not only effective for ending chronic homelessness, but it helps to ma maintain long-term housing stability by providing ongoing supportive services. I would respectfully ask, on behalf of Samaritan Daytop Village, that this committee oppose Intro 915. Allow us to continue to be on the forefront, on the front lines, in partnership with you and your communities serving the most vulnerable New Yorkers. Thank you for this opportunity to provide this testimony. I thank the chair and the committee for the opportunity to be heard this afternoon. I'm Jim Dill, Executive Director of Housing and Services, Inc. We have three supportive housing projects in Manhattan in the 100-unit scatter site program in Upper Manhattan in the Bronx. We've been operating supportive housing since 1988. We have two major concerns about possible unintended consequences of intro 915. First, it puts supportive housing, the solution to homelessness, on the same report as a perceived problem. Shelters and cluster sites. People are going to look at the report, they're going to see the shelters and the cluster sites and think we're part of the problem too and not part of the solution. Second, the potential stigmatizing of our tenants. This one really worries us. The proposed bill may effectively recast our residents' tenancy into just some kind of continuation of their former homelessness. Some of our special needs tenants have been with us for more than 20 years, but the proposed bill keeps their housing on the report. I have to ask, when does it end? Are our tenants always going to be forever defined by the rock bottom period in their lives? 40% of our tenants don't even need to be homeless. By just residing in our projects, are they going to be thrown into the perceived problem too? Here's who they are by uh, project. In Manhattan CV6, up to 80 disabled vets with military service ranging from Vietnam to Iraq. In CB9, up to 36 predominantly African American or Hispanic retired senior citizens. In CB7, up to 22 predominantly retired seniors who have resided in the neighborhood for tw over 23 years. These folks deserve to be honored and to be cared for and should not be set up to be feared and stigmatized. Overall, there's a lot for us to be optimistic about. New York's streamlining of how supportive housing can be produced has opened many new opportunities. IRS income averaging now allows households with incomes up to 80% of AMI to be eligible for a 6040 project. We can now envision projects that speak to community, specific community housing needs, such as seniors, young families, and all kinds of intergenerational housing combinations. We want to do 60-40s, so for every six supportive housing units that get delayed, so do four affordable units. Times are exciting, but the barriers are still high. 
We think the unintended consequences of the proposed bill to create another barrier at the time when New Yorkers urgently need fewer barriers to housing. Thank you. Thank you very much to this panel. Uh, and thank you for all the great work that you're all doing. Thank you. Uh, next panel, Trish Marsick, Services for the Underserved, Olga Rodriguez Vidal, Safe Horizon, and last was unsigned. I don't know if. Oh, oh, oh okay. Okay. And that'll be the last panel. Just you. It's okay, I've done this before. Good afternoon, Chair Levin. Thank you for hearing my testimony today on this very important issue. My name is Trish Marsick, and I am the Chief Operating Officer for Services for the Underserved, commonly referred to as SUS. SUS is a 40-year-old human services organization that annually provides over $200 million in services to 37,000 of our city's most vulnerable citizens. This includes individuals in recovery from mental illness, individuals with dis developmental disabilities, veterans, women and children who have experienced domestic violence, people who have lost their homes, and individuals and families who have been disadvantaged by poverty. On any given night in 2018, SUS provided housing and shelter to more than 4,500 of these New Yorkers. Last year, over 600 individuals moved from our shelters, treatment residences, and transitional housing into permanent homes of their own. And 92% of SUS's permanent housing residents maintained stable housing. SUS has a successful track record of serving the res residents of 41 of our city's 59 community boards. Um, and with three other partners, we recently were awarded um, the opportunity to develop 2,400 units of supportive and affordable housing in central Brooklyn. The bill being proposed requiring that the Department of Social Services submit to every council member and community board and post on its website quarterly reports on the number of shelters, supportive housing, and cluster sites will have serious and perhaps unintended consequences for providers such as SUS, as well as for the communities we seek to serve and for whom these services may be much needed. While it may highlight which communities may be shouldering a disproportionate number of such facilities, it will not prompt those communities with less representation of these facilities to take on any greater responsibility. As my colleagues have highlighted, the bill may have unintend may unintentionally present supportive housing in a negative light, rather than as a positive response to a need, a vehicle for ending chronic homelessness, a means by which affordable housing is brought to communities, and a source for creating much needed jobs. Requiring that supportive housing be reported to communities singles out this housing type as being in need of scrutiny and oversight, unlike other forms of permanent affordable housing. This serves only to perpetuate the myth and stigma surrounding supportive housing that leads to unfounded fear and a lack of embrace by communities. And we are grateful for this council's support in opening these facilities in those places where we have them. We note that last year the council requested acceleration of production of new supportive housing from 500 to 700 units per year, an acknowledgement that the need is that pressing. With this proposed bill, community boards and council districts may declare a systemic moratorium rather than the individualized support we consistently get on supportive housing until they can be assured that all communities will carry their share of this responsibility. However, no provision has been made in this bill to help encourage supportive housing in neighborhoods that may not have much of it. SUS looks forward to working with the council to build more much needed supportive housing across New York City we are happy to discuss ways to encourage more of it in all neighborhoods. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate your testimony. Um, I want to thank uh, you for all the good work that you guys do at SUS and keep it up and look forward to working with you in the new year. Great to see you. See you as well. I want to thank uh, all of the panelists. I want to thank the Commissioner Banks and his staff, as well as my colleagues, uh, all staff members of the General Welfare Committee, uh, and my staff as well, and, and our sergeants at arms for, uh, for being here. And now at 5.07, this hearing is adjourned. Happy holidays, everybody.